So I guess we, here we go, got it. Um, so let's pull up the first slide. Here we are, everybody, you made it to the right place. Meeting number two, Environmental Justice Coalition. What a great pleasure to see everybody. Um, you see Grant uh, Grant's email in the opening slide. Um, please uh, don't, don't hesitate to reach out if you end up having any technical information or technical needs. Grant, you wanna give a wave, so people see a name and a face. There you go. You can go to the next slide. As uh, we will do every meeting, per direction um, and with appreciation for the Climate Commitment Act um, that's providing funding and support for the work that we're collectively doing. Um, so you can thank your electeds across the state of Washington. If you go to the next slide, let's do some introductions. So um, we can keep going to the next slide. I, I wanna remind folks, so we have, you all are surrounded by a team of people who are really helping uh, uh, behind the scenes and sometimes in the scenes uh, make this work possible in partnership with you all. You'll hear from several uh, folks that, that you may not have met yet, um, including uh, Dana and Zachary. And I'll have the two of you really introduce yourselves later in the agenda. Some of these names are not in the room today, um, and but we just wanna make sure you're familiar and just see, again, this through line between um, kind of some of the folks you met in the last meeting, some that you'll re-meet and continue to meet throughout the process, um, but just know you're surrounded by a group of folks. So um, why don't we do some some introductions? Some of these folks you'll you'll also hear from today, but um, let's why don't we start with our our folks that are supporting the work? So uh, I can start with my team as a reminder. Um, ben Duncan met, uh, I think, all of you at this point. Um, with Kearns and West, we're the kind of lead facilitating team for this work. I'll pass it to my colleague Nicole. Hi everyone, my name is Nicole. Nice to nice to meet you. I'll be sending. I'm the one sending lots of emails to folks with materials and just manage keeping my finger on the process overall. Thank you, Nicole Grant. I know Grant's got like five things going on at the same time. Grant, please say hello. Hello, everyone. I'm Grant. I'm uh, a project plenty of Kearns and West. Please reach out to me if you have any tech needs during this meeting. Okay, we're going to keep putting names with faces. Jenna? Hi, everyone. Jenna, Hi, everyone. Jenna Oh, Oh, sorry. Hi, this is Jenna Kay with Clark County Community Planning, um, serving as the project manager for this project. Awesome. Amy? And hi, everyone. I'm Amy Koski. I am in the public health department at the county, and I am working closely with Jenna and community planning on this project. Glad to be here. Lauren? Hi, I'm Lauren Henriksen, also with public health and working with Amy and Jenna on this. Thank you. Tracy? Hi, everyone. I'm Tracy Lunsford. She, her pronouns. I am with Parametrics. Thank you. Dana? Hi everyone, I'm Dana Hellman um, with Kappa Strategies. We're leading the resilience sub-element component of this work. Right, Zachary? Hi, I'm Zachary Boyce, working with Dana uh, in leading the uh, resilience sub-element of this work. <clears throat> right, and you'll hear more from Zachary and, and Dana later in the evening. So let's uh, move to our uh, Environmental Justice Coalition folks. I'll go in the order of my screen. Aaron, you're the first one up. We can. Hi, Aaron uh, Hamilton, I you. Urban Teen. Thank you. Uh, Paris? Hey, y'all. Paris Nelson here, Fourth Plane Forward. Thank you. Anna? There's two of us today, uh, but um, Ana Karen Betancourt Macias, she, her, ella, Latino Leadership Northwest. Hi, Rose Mendoza, Latino Leadership Northwest. Thanks. Welcome, Rose. Good to see you. Um, Alana? Good evening, everyone. My name is Alana Tadella with the Pacific Islander Health Board of Washington. Great, thank you. Laura? Hey, everyone. Laura Ellsworth, she, her pronouns. I'm with Council for the Homeless. Thank you. Dania? Hi, everyone. I'm Dania, um, ED Sakura 13 Energy Youth Association. Dania, I'll remember how to pronounce that next time. Thank you. Monica? Hi everyone, Monica Zazueta, she, her pronouns from Vancouver Metro LULAC Council number 47026. 
Rolls off the tongue. Thank you, Monica. Uh, Gabriela? Hi, this is Gabriela Mendoza Ewing with Hispanic Disability Support of Southwest Washington. I'm connected from up north, so I might have to step out sooner than this meeting because I'm in a conference. Thank you. Okay, well, thanks for joining while you can, uh, Gabriela. Um, Rebecca? Hi, Rebecca O'Brien, Free Clinic of Southwest Washington. Thank you. Uh, Catherine? She's also with the free clinic. She might have someone in her office potentially. Okay, thank you. We'll uh, welcome her back in the space when she comes. Uh, Patricia? Hi, I'm Patricia Haggerty from the Farm Food Justice Network. Any little helper today? And always a helper. <laughs> always helping, yes. Uh, <laughs> Angela? Hi everyone, my name is Angela. I work for Pacific Islander Community Association of Washington as their wellness navigator. All right, thank you, Yolanda. You out there, Yolanda? Let's go to Jude. I will right, we'll come back. Who did I who did I mess here? Do we get everybody? Oh, Mike not working, Jude. Okay, thank you. Then Yolanda, we'll we'll keep an eye out for you. If you if you come on, we'll we'll introduce you to the space. So thank you, everyone. And we didn't, you know, we can build other practices in the future, but for now, just continuing to learn who each other is in the moment um, and where we're coming from. So let's bring the slides back up. I'm gonna walk through some of the logistics for tonight and then uh, we'll really dive into the presentation. So from a purpose, what we hope to kind of come out of here today with is we'll, we'll do a reminder of our group agreements. And as folks hopefully remember, we shared kind of a, a, a process and engagement plan that included a number of, of different items, including group agreements. Uh, we'll have a chance to hear uh, some feedback and reflection from our Clark County colleagues um, and to hear from you on your work plans and some of the initial engagement that will be rolling out in the spring. We, uh, as we talked a little bit about at our first conversation, preparing to develop an equity lens. And for tonight's purposes, we have some prompting questions and some framing that we hope you all will think through as we co-create and develop a tool that can be used throughout this process to ensure that we're holding uh, the values uh, and practice of environmental justice as we do our work together uh, through, through this frame of an equity lens. Um, and then you'll hear a presentation and we have some questions for you all that will inform again, inform some of that engagement around some really important discussions around climate hazards and, and impacts. And we'll know more about a resilient sub element and what the heck that means, um, I hope by the end of this conversation this evening. Any questions around our agenda, what we're hoping to accomplish this evening, this afternoon and evening? Okay, let's keep going. Next slide. So this is how we're actually going to move through it. Um, so I will we'll confirm and, and affirm um, our group agreements. Again, just really hoping that we have some level of agreement of what's going to make sure that each of you feels like you can bring your full self and full voice into the room. Um, we'll, again, as I reflected, uh, we'll talk about the engagement plans and do a little bit of visioning for potential collaboration, make sure that we're also um, identifying any populations that we may not be including in our current engagement and conversations around what we may do to reconcile that. We'll spend some time with the equity lens, we'll take a break, and then we'll spend some time in hazards, uh, both presentation and discussion. We will create space for public comments. So I'll just put that out there now for folks who may be joining in the audience who are interested in public uh, input to this group. We'll create some space towards the end of our meetings and, um, and then we'll do some wrap up and next steps. Okay, let's go next slide. Uh, 
we're, we're sharing this uh, both for our for those uh, that are joining from the public, um, but also for you all. So this slide, of course, is public record. It'll be on the website. Uh, we encourage you all to share this. Uh, it's a place where you can track and understand the work that's unfolding um, for, for our group um, and for the broader uh, project itself. So again, just a resource. Hopefully it's something that you all can utilize and, and your communities can utilize going forward. Go to the next slide. So we've found our way here. So that's step one. Um, you all are joined as panelists. Members of the public are as attendees. So the panelists are on screen. You all can talk to each other. Those who are joining by attendees can observe and witness the conversations that we have, but they are not contributing unless they're promoted to provide public comment. We do ask for the most part, stay on mute when not speaking. I generally will ask that you raise your hand. There's a raise hand button. We'll get to a place, I think, as we establish community, I'll also see if you come off mute, I'll call on you. Eventually I'll look into your eyes and know that you want to say something. Um, so we'll build that type of relationship, but please use your raise hand uh, to get in the queue. It'll help us order the conversation. If you end up or join by phone, star nine raises your hand, star six unmutes. Uh, so I think everybody except for the meeting room is not on phone, but if you join by phone, that's how you raise your hand. Um, again, you can email Grant if you have any questions or, or issues technically. Um, to the extent that uh, we get into this practice, um, saying your name and affiliation as a reminder, certainly you can also, and we'll talk about changing your name. So mm -hmm. those who are joining by public know what perspectives being brought forward. Mm -hmm. And then this is a three hour meeting from 3.30 to 6.30. Please take care of yourself. Y'all are um, y'all are, are adult humans that, um, although we have some little non-adult humans um, joining us, please take care of yourself. If you need to eat, please eat. Stay on screen as much as you can to help create community but also, you know, it's a long meeting to be on. So I'll use, uh, rely on your all's judgment around how you take care of yourself, but please do. Next slide. Um, we do ask that folks are renaming themselves. Uh, this is not just um, helpful for our team as we get to know you all better, uh, but certainly for those who are joining from the public. Um, so if you go in, you can click on, if you hover over your, your box, there's three dots, ellipses that show up. You click on that, you scroll down to rename, you can change yourself. So if you wanna put name, what we would advise is that you're on the EJC pronouns, if you'd like to share them for the group, um, and that would be really helpful. So we're really delineating both EJC member and then if you wanna include your organization, please do. Next slide. Um, Zoom chat, um, audience is not able to chat um, or do Q&A, so the primary mechanism for the audience is public comment if they'd like to interact and engage with the group. For you all, uh, we can use chat, so if you go, the one thing I will ask is that you use everyone. So if you click on your chat button, it'll send send chat, you have kind of choices between host and panelists, and everyone, please use everyone. Uh, that ensures that folks that are in the audience are able to track any of that conversation. I will just note, generally speaking, you put something in the chat, Yolanda, for example, I see that your speaker isn't working, so thank you. Um, I also see, is it Almendra? Was that uh, Paris? Yes, okay. Yes. Thank you. Um, so two things, one, that's make sure if you do use chat, it goes to everyone. I'll encourage folks to bring conversations into the room, um, not use chat as a virtual side conversation. Okay, so we'll monitor it as best as possible. I'll try to come and regulate y'all. If you try to get too side conversation -y over there, let's bring it into the room, uh, really cultivate a good uh, productive conversation. You go to the next slide. And then um, I think we, we covered raise hand maybe, but you can see the raise hand button. It has a hand that looks like that. Um, so please click on that. It'll help if show captions, we've enabled closed captioning. So it's helpful for your participation. You can click on the CC button at the bottom or show captions. Um, that should help you uh, participate if, if 
that's beneficial. We go next slide. I promise I'm almost done with all the logistics. Uh, for public uh, comment, we've carved out uh, some time at the, towards the end of our agenda. We welcome input from, from our audience, from our communities. We will include that at every meeting. Um, if you'd like to raise, uh, uh, provide public comment, you can raise your hand now as an audience and we'll put you in the queue. We will also ask right um, as we get into that agenda item. So if you do want to let us know if you're going to provide public comment, feel free to do so now by raising your hand. We'll uh, make sure we call on you later. Um, you can also provide written uh, input. You can see the uh, comp, C-O-M-P dot plan, P-L-A-N at Clark dot W-A dot G-O-V or comment online and I won't read the whole link, but it's clark.wash.gov community planning and we will share these slides You can click on the links and provide written input to the group. Next slide. And this is a lot of stuff. All right, we moved through most of those logistics. So just as, as a starting point for us, um, some guidelines that we often use for productive meetings, really trying to stick to the agenda, focusing and honing in on the topic that we're discussing. It also allows folks externally to track our discussions more easily. We're going to balance speaking time, right? So I'm going to ask you all to pay attention to this. And part of my job as a facilitator and ensure that we're either creating structures or process or asking people to step up or step back. We do want you to bring things that are coming up to you as early in the process as possible. Even though this is a quick process that we're moving through, the sooner we can identify things that are being raised, the better we can address them and embed them into our process and structures. Um, ask questions, right? You're gonna hear some information today. Um, ask issues, address issues um, as they come up and focus on substance. Um, Love each other, learn to understand each other, right? Seek out understanding of other perspectives. Um, we're okay, we can deliberate. Um, we can have different ideas we bring to the table. Hopefully that will strengthen our work. And of course, um, just holding respect. And, and I'm not gonna describe or define that for you all. We're gonna do that. We're gonna show it in the way that we interact with each other. I will ask just if there's anything that is missing that feels important for you, that we have as a guideline that we want to hold, it would be great to hear it. So just anything that you all need um, or that you need as an individual to feel like you can fully participate. Okay. I'm going to pause for a second. Uh, Min, it looked like you had joined since we started. Can you say hello? Yes. I had to manually enter the the uh, meeting ID and using your link. So, oh, well, you're here now, man. Where where are you coming from? Who are you? Uh, me. Uh, so I'm representing Vietnamese community of Black County here. Perfect. Thank you, man. Glad to to have you here. So we were just moving through meeting logistics. Uh, uh, missed anything? So we can go to the next slide. Firm group, we can keep going. So, is this me still with the role? I forgot, I don't have my little notes in front of me to tell me who's supposed to say what. So, as a reminder, I know we've had this conversation for you all, and I know Nicole and I had the chance to meet with many of you before we walked in. So, really just a reminder to ground yourselves in, in the work that, that you'll be doing. So, one, part of your job is really to represent and bring forward and to connect the interests of, of vulnerable populations and overburdened communities. And we're using that language really intentionally, and you'll see it throughout tonight that it's really connected to the statutory legislative and commerce guidance um, that defines the work that's in front of us. Uh, you all know and, and are contracted to do public engagement and to, to have work plans connected to, to reaching out to conduct um, engagement activities that bring the voices of folks that you work with every day and represent and serve um, into our into our work and influence the, the decisions. And, and then finally, and, and I mentioned this earlier, developing an equity lens that will really help the, the Clark County team and the, the Climate Advisory Group 
um, guide policy and ultimately goal recommendations that land in the climate um, element of the plan. Any questions around role? Okay, let's keep going. So this is, you know, we have our, our kind of group guidelines for how we interact in our space. And then there's group agreements for kind of the broader expectation. And, and we'll just show this, I'll be brief because this is largely goes without saying, right? To show up prepared to, to engage, to make a good effort to, to be in the space as much as possible, to stay briefed on the work. We're gonna move fast. There's gonna be a lot coming at you. So really just staying abreast of what's happening, acting in good faith, really meaning that you're showing up towards solution oriented um, vision that we're respectfully exchanging ideas and really that to the best of your ability and comfort that you're lifting up and naming the interests that, um, and concerns of community to ensure that we're um, not just bringing things into the room, but resolving differences and identifying commonality and, and common ground. So again, a lot of this has been laid out. Everything I've seen and learned about y'all is really deeply connected to this, just in the way that you show up in practice. So I won't belabor the point. Let's keep going. So now I'm gonna pass it um, and some reflection around the brainstorming. Um, we're gonna spend some time just getting some feedback around the work that you've already done. And then we're gonna try to imagine a little bit together. All right, so I'll jump in here. Um, thanks to everybody for getting your work plan draft, your first draft in. I know we put a really quick turnaround on that. So kudos to all of you for diving right in and, and just really running with it because we've gotten some really great feedback from all of you and we're excited to continue um, helping just refine and massage little bits here and there as we get these work plans finalized. So um, next slide, uh, please. And I wanted to take a moment to review this timeline. We talked a little bit about it last meeting. And so we're looking at these four different phases of the public engagement timeline. The first one being priority climate impacts. And we're going to be starting to dig into that today. That's one of the presentations you'll be hearing today from CAPA Strategies. And um, then phase two is looking at the resilience related draft goal and policy ideas. Phase three it would be moving into priorities and criteria for greenhouse gas policies. And then uh, phase four is looking at the draft greenhouse, greenhouse gas goal and policy ideas. And so there are different points along the, the next month together that we could go back to our communities and ask key questions. And so we've, we've already listed these key o overarching questions, but we want to be working with you all to um, kind of get feedback on what questions we should be asking, expand on these at each phase of the process. And then we'll be putting together questions that you could use if you're going to be putting a survey out to your community at any one of these four phases. We'll have a set of questions that we will have worked with you to put together and come up with that will then be translated and you can send out to your communities. We're also gonna be able to help you if you would like to customize some questions for your community, but generally just know that we'll be working alongside you and with you to really start to come up with these different questions that will be meaningful for the project and also um, you, all, you all will help inform that. So the next slide includes a little bit of a, a overview of kind of how that's going to work what that approach will look like. So we will be per, um, working with you all to provide background information, much like the first real presentation you're gonna to hear today on some of the climate resilience related topic. And so we'll provide this background information at meetings and ask for your questions and guidance. And then that will feed into questions that could go back to um, your communities. We'll draft those questions based on your guidance and your ideas, 
and then you can use those questions or translate them or, or customize them. We'll translate the overarching questions like I mentioned, but you could also customize them as well. And then we'll bring your feedback. You'll all bring your feedback to the EJC and, and the county will be collecting information as well that will be uh, brought back for you all to hear. We'll share what we're finding and then uh, talk about recommendations based on what we've heard. The project team will interact and address those that feedback and then share that with the community advisory group at their monthly meetings. And then once the community advisory group has information or recommendations coming back the other direction, you'll have a chance at the EJC to review that feedback and um, consider how it's addressed and, and how we move forward next. So wanted to give that sort of next big picture <laughs> overview of how this is going to work. Next slide. We also, because of all the work you all have been doing and um, just the, the diligence you've all taken with your work plan, there have been a lot of questions and we acknowledge that we've thrown a lot at you. So wanted to just spend a few minutes to talk about some overarching uh, frequently asked questions. Next slide. We broke these up into two different categories, one being questions related to invoicing for meeting attendance and preparation. This is related to your first agreement with the county for the $2,800 to attend meetings and prep and also create your work plan. So I'm just going to sort of quickly go through these and we can ask questions at the end. So hold your questions if you think of something that we haven't addressed. Um, and then the other set of questions will be on your work plan development. So I'll focus on invoicing related questions for meeting attendance and preparation to start. So is the work of the EJC based on reimbursement? The answer is yes. So we, um, we will need to get an invoice from you after you've completed or attended, in this case, your meetings. Um, and, and so it will be based on reimbursement. Same will be true for your work plan related agreements and invoicing that we'll talk about later. Who should I send my invoices to? Please make sure you send those, all of those um, invoice, work plan, and contract related questions and communications to Lauren, Jenna, and myself. And um, one of the three of us will be sure to get back to you. And then can I submit invoices to the county yet? Yes, some of you have already done so, so please feel free to submit your invoice now for January and February. And then whatever cadence works best for you is fine. Monthly would be great, but it does not have to be, and we're happy to work with you to fill out your, your invoices. So again, we're just talking about meeting attendance, preparation, and work plan development at this point, but feel free to get those invoices in. Next slide. So how do I use the hourly compensation rates? This has been a question and um, we probably could have been more clear in how we included this in your first agreement, but there is a table at the end of your, uh, of your agreement and it has two different rates. The schedule that talks about ongoing hourly compensation is the one that you'll use for meeting attendance and preparation and it breaks it down by the time spent attending or participating in these meetings. Um, so, and it goes up by $45 increments. So you're gonna put for if it was a 30 or 30 minute up to a 60 minute meeting, it'll be $45. If you spent three hours like we're going to or planning to tonight, um, it would be $135 for attending this meeting. And you could always add a little bit of extra if you needed to do prep for this meeting as well, but that would probably be up, a, up to the 30 minute $45 rate just for prep to, on this. Um, for this today's meeting, for example. Um, on, before we move on to the next slide, I just want to make sure I note that um, we're not yet invoicing for public engagement activities because we're still finalizing work plans and we will be finalizing the agreement with the county for that second, second contract. And so please just make sure you don't spend a lot of time. We, we can have you invoice us for your development of those work plans, but don't spend time yet on public engagement activities because we will not be able to retroactively reimburse you for that time. So really what we're shooting for is by the end of this month, by the end of March, we'll have those second agreements in place and you'll be well on your way to start your public engagement beginning, um, beginning of April. 
Next slide. So who can time be submitted for at the meeting? Uh, we just wanted to make sure that this was clear, again, because we've had so much information. One person per organization is um, well, the ideal who would be attending up to the 14 monthly EJC meetings. We have included some extra funds within that $2,800 for um, some flexibility, and especially in these early months, potentially you have more than one of you really engaged just to make sure you get the work plan in place. So we understand if you want to invoice for some other person's time, but it's really for one person's time at these monthly meetings with a little bit of additional funding for that prep and work plan development. We uh, are happy to team up with you to talk about um, how to make sure you don't exhaust those funds too early and, and what it should look like kind of from month to month so that you you can utilize the full $2,800 and don't um, exhaust it too quickly. So um, what we're recommending is that as you continue to refine your work plans for the public engagement activities, really use that as an opportunity to build in all the diff different administrative time and staff preparation and all the different things that you're going to need to deliver those public engagement activities because um, we know that the meeting attendance and preparation agreement is a little bit limited. It will not cover everything. Next slide. So moving on. Oh. oh, never mind. Sorry, I thought we skipped one. Uh, so moving on to work plan development uh, related questions, because that's now where we all are. And um, there's been some questions uh, about, you know, what what types of activities can we include, and are there any is there anything that's out of scope? So we just want to let you know that we will be reviewing the work plans for consistency with all of the county related obligations. We do have different things that we have to make sure that the activities um, meet. And so we'll we'll make sure that we get in touch with you if we have any questions or concerns or if there needs to be an adjustment made. So just wanted to point that out and that um, there's been some questions about, you know, how many people do we have to reach and is there a low number or a, a max number, you know, a high or a low number. There is no quota. There, We don't have any particular expectations. We want you to tell us what makes sense for your community. And um, it could be uh, just a few people that you're really wanting to get quality data from and spend more time with, and that's what your, your capacity is for your organization. So we don't have a, a minimum or a maximum number of folks. I also wanted to just mention today we'll be talking about some of the ideas that are coming out in the work plans that you all have put forward and that um, there could be an opportunity for some collaboration and there may be overlap. You'll, you'll, you all know each other and some, some of your organizations have worked together in the past so potentially there's an opportunity to see if there are places for collaboration or considering how you reach out to your um, communities, especially if there might be overlapping community members and um, thinking about how best to reach out and you know ask survey questions but not over overburden individuals with too many questions. So so there will be a chance for us to talk more about that. Uh, next slide. So what materials will the county translate and what should I include in my work plan? We've talked through this with some of you in the work plan development, especially as you fill out your budget sheet that is not necessarily, that does not need to be submitted to the county. But um, as I mentioned in that timeline at the very beginning of my, my talk, there are these four phases of public engagement and we'll have a set, set of questions that you could use. The county will translate those set questions with your imp that we've gotten from your input and feedback. We'll translate those into six languages and we will work with you all to determine what languages that should be so that you're able to then use that translated material for your communities. Um, 
you should include expenses for translation, <clears throat> excuse me, translation of materials that you decide to develop in addition to what's provided by the county. And you'll also want to include expenses for interpretation services for any gatherings that you will be hosting. So hopefully that helps kind of explain that differentiation between what the county will do and what um, you should include in your budget. Next slide. Um, what documentation do I need to include as a deliverable to the county? This is a piece that we will be working on a little bit in more detail in the next couple of weeks as we get to a more finalized work plan with each of your organizations because there are some specific things that we're going to need at the county. Um, planning projects and especially growth management acts related projects involve a lot of documentation and so um, please feel free to add that to your work plan to cover this. We know we're asking you for a lot and we have tried to reduce it where we can, but there will be a certain amount of documentation that we're going to have to have you save and then submit at your when you submit your invoices for your public engagement work. So we will be work when we get back to each of you on your draft work plans that you just submitted, we'll confirm the specific deliverables that we're going to need for each type of activity you have chosen in your work plan. And it will be fairly consistent across all of your work plans that will have a, a list basically of very specific things that we'll need. But for example, it will include things like survey discussion questions, survey or discussion questions. It will include um, survey results or feedback or interview questions or um, notes that you took from your interviews, those kinds of things. It will include copies of communication. And this is a new piece of information that we haven't really spoken about at great length yet, but you'll need to save all emails that you send and receive related to your public engagement activities, as well as social media posts that you make and comments that you receive on those posts, and then news releases and newsletters. We can talk more about what that, you know, if, if there are more questions, happy to answer those um, and talk in one-on-one -on -one meetings about how how to help you track those those details. Also, we will be looking for any materials that you produced for your events and activities. If there are recordings, we will need copies of those and then any final products that came as a result. All project emails should be saved in a broad sense. In addition to, you'll need to supply um, documentation of your emails related to specific engagement activities when you submit your invoice. But in general, just uh, keep, a, keep a mind to save all emails related to this project. And um, we won't necessarily need to get, you know, logistical email copies from you, but if it's related to your delivering of a survey instrument or a focus group or something, we'll need to have copies of those. And then um, if you're collaborating in any way with other EJC members here, other organizations, you'll want to save those emails as well. And then just a reminder, because um, this is a public process, if we have ever have, we, we cannot have EJC, EJC members engaging in communication via email or telephone with seven or more of you at one time, that includes yourself, because that would be a quorum and would mean that it's a public meeting and there are requirements like this meeting that we have to follow when it's a public meeting. So just kind of keep that in mind. We're so a lot of detail and um, bureaucracy to share, but we're um, happy to answer questions as we go along. So next slide. And the county staff helped me with my public engagement activity? And the answer is yes, we're here to help you. We can work with you to customize questions and come up with informational materials as needed. We are also available to provide support at your engagement activities. So we can take notes, we can answer questions, we could be there to um, help answer some of the climate related specific questions if that's helpful, or we can be in the background, you know, 
stacking the table, especially if that saves you from staff and capacity and additional costs on your work plan budget. Next slide. I'm almost done. <laughs> um, so just a few other EJC related questions. Who should I contact if I have questions that are not related to my invoice or my work plan or my contractual agreement? That would be to reach out to Ben and Nicole. You're always welcome to also include um, Lauren, Jenna, and myself. But uh, for those invoice and work plan specific questions, Lauren, Amy, and Jenna are the contacts for that. The um, Couldn't the EJC meet in person? And so we, the answer is definitely yes. We've heard from some of you that that is uh, definitely of interest. And then given group preferences for virtual or hybrid meetings, we are recommending that most meetings will occur virtually with this hybrid setup. Uh, but we could, ha you know, have have an occasional where we say let's get the majority of us, whoever can and would like to, and it, it's feasible. We can have a in-person hybrid meeting, um, and we would talk with you all and make sure you're in agreement. The public is always invited to attend our EJC meetings in person or remotely as well. I think I covered all of the FAQ <laughs> related questions. Are there any questions for me at this point? Yes, Monica, I saw your question in the chat. Let's start there. So the question was around saving posts and comments. Is that screenshot work for that? Yes. Okay. That would be perfect. Yeah, if you just make sure you screenshot those and keep a file, that would be great. Okay, then let's go to Anna and or Rose. Um, whichever one of you, and then we'll, uh, there's another comment in the chat. So Anna or Rose? Um, yes, just for, sorry, um, just for my, my brain to understand, um, how many hours can we bill like per month on our invoice? Um, is there, you know, a number we shouldn't go past or, or yeah. Kind of. So the, you are able to use a rate that works for you and your organization and then really just make sure you're accounting for all the time that you imagine or figure that it will take for you to deliver those activities and that is sufficient we still can't go we cannot exceed the total seventy two hundred dollars for the total contract and agreement but within each of your one or two or three activities, you are welcome to, you know, include as many hours as you believe it will take you to deliver that project, that activity. Perfect. Thank you, Thank then. You. And thanks. And then Laura, your comment around, uh, yeah, I mean, I, it, I don't know, if, does Clark County have a policy? So this is, it's either guidance or a policy for folks if and when we show up in person is there language that is like stay home when you're sick kind of thing? I'm sure that, I'm sure that we have. Yes, I do. Yes, I, I do. I do. I do. Oh, sorry. Sorry. I'm going to unmute, Jenna. I know. Sorry, I'm messing up our own audio system. Um, uh, yes, uh, county guidance is if you are feeling ill to please do not show up um, in uh, for an in-person meeting. Um, and similarly, um, if there are a variety of reasons why people may not want to come in person that may not have to do with being sick. That's okay too. I don't, we we will never have a situation where you have to show up in person um, as well. That makes sense. Yeah. It'll always be hybrid. There'll always be a hybrid option for every. Option. Yes. yes. Thank you, Jenna. Thank you, Laura, for that question. Any other questions? Again, I mean, if you all have specific, really in intentional, specific questions around your particular issue. Um, Please, you know, don't hesitate to reach out to Jenny, Amy, Lauren. Um, but anything else coming up for you? Yeah, Paris, you're coming to some realizations. These FAQs are there's nice when your colleagues ask questions that now you're getting the benefit of the response. So that's good. Okay. Well, not seeing any for today. Again, if y'all have questions, you know who to contact. Thank you, Amy, for walking through that um, so thoroughly and for folks just being really intentional about asking the 
to questions that you've had. So let's let's go to the next slide. Um, the Jenna. So we're going to do a two part process here. Um, first is is uh, just really reflecting on some of the high level um, things that folks are doing, right? So Jenna and Amy. Lauren, I don't know, maybe at least Jenna and Amy, I know you've, you've been looking at work plans and having conversations with folks. So we're going to reflect on kind of what we're seeing across the board. And then we're going to ask you all to kind of share a bit and start thinking about where we might see some collaboration. So Jenna, why don't you kick us off? All right. And I think if we can go to the next slide, I think we went, well, we wanted to recap and then we will go into the sharing, if I'm not mistaken. Okay. Um, okay. Sorry, Amy and I are pointing at each other on who's doing this. Okay. So uh, just so as a recap, um, uh, Lauren, Amy, and I will follow up with each of you this week on uh, your the draft work plans that you submitted, and so we'll connect on any feedback we have. If we feel like um, it, it uh, if we want to do another conversation with you all, uh, so expect to hear from us this week. Um, as Amy mentioned, our goal is to try to get to final versions of those work plans by March 15th. That's what we're striving for. Um, if some of you need a little bit more time, it's okay, but that's our general timeline we're, we're aiming for. Um, and then uh, the county, we are so close to getting through our contracts department. We almost have a draft agreement to share with all of you. So you'll be able to review that uh, as well. And then we will, once you have a, a final work plan, we will attach it to that agreement. Um, and that'll be the agreement what that uh, the second agreement for 72 up to $7,200 to sign. And we're striving to get that done by the end of March. Um, some of you may move a little bit faster than others. So as soon as we have all of your documents, um, we will work on executing and get you get you going. And if, for those of you who may need a little bit more time, that's okay. We will we will take that time. Um, we have set up um, a Calendly link. So um, if you want to meet again with us, please just feel free. Uh, we'll send you this link after this meeting as well um, to click on that and schedule a meeting with Lauren, Amy, or I, or, or some combination of the, the three of us um, to, to meet with us to talk about work plan stuff uh, or invoicing things. Um, and then one other thing we wanted to mention is um, Juan Monje. He is a member of the other advisory group, the community advisory group involved in this project. And um, in talking with him a bit, he just wanted to offer, um, he is a community organizer with the organization Columbia Riverkeeper. Um, so he does quite a bit of organizing with uh, migrant farm workers and immigrants um, in the area. And he is willing and available to help collaborate. So if you would like his help getting feedback um, as part of your EJC engagement work and you feel like uh, what he does fits well with what you're trying to do. Um, he would be happy to, to collaborate and help get feedback from those he works with um, on a regular basis. So if that's at all of interest to you, uh, please let Lauren, Amy, and I know, and we can share his contact information. Okay, next slide. Okay, and now now we're going to go into the sharing part. All right, so. Uh, so again, um, as Amy said, thank you so much for very quickly putting together some draft work plans. Um, we wanted to now move into sort of an opportunity for you all to learn a little bit more about what each other is thinking. Um, so just to start that conversation, um, we, as we've looked through them, as you've submitted them, um, some of some of the, sort of the high level things that are standing out to us um, are that Many of you are proposing to do surveys, some in person, some online, uh, some geared towards adults, some geared towards youth. Um, many of you have been thinking about hosting some kind of event, uh, some in person, some virtual, um, and lots of community discussions, or a lot of you use different terminology, but right, discussions or conversations or circles or town halls or question answer sessions. Um, uh, several folks are thinking about having some focus groups or interviews. Um, we have people proposing some live presentations, videos, um, radio shows. Um, some of the ideas include a drawing, sewing, or dance component in them. Um, 
Uh, some of you are thinking of doing some social media campaigns, and there's also some polling. So that's just a flavor of what we were seeing as we were reviewing your work plan. And uh, I think we'll go to the next slide and I'll pass it back to Ben. Yeah, thanks, Jenna. So we're going to move through. I'd love to have a conversation. And we don't we don't have time for you to basically read through your entire work plan. So I'll just premise it by saying that. But love to create some space where um, all of you can provide some high-level summary of key tactics, building off the slide that Jenna just shared, um, and, and importantly, sharing something that you're really excited about, or maybe something that you feel is really unique that, that you're um, that you're thinking for your community. And hopefully, you know, part of the, the purpose of this is to begin not just sharing kind of mutual excitement and growing the collective energy, but opportunities to see connection, to collaborate, to learn from each other, to embrace uh, different ideas, to be more creative. All the things that I hope um, will kind of organically emerge as you all share. So before we do that, I think we had some folks join since uh, last time. Levita, Karen, I know you all tricked us last time because one person came on and then the other person came on. I thought I saw you all. Yeah, today it's just me and Levita. Thanks, Levita. Thanks for, for joining. And then Almendra, um, I know Paris introduced you by name, but do you want to pop on and say hello? Yes. Can you all hear me pretty well? We can hear you, yes. Perfect. Uh, my name's Almendra. Oh, I think my camera's off. My name's Almendra. I work with um, Fourth Green Forward. Okay. Well, welcome. Uh, good to have you here. So, why don't we start with Fourth Plane Forward? Paris Almendra, do you all want to kick us off? Happy to start. So, hey, y'all, I don't want to take up too much time, but um, just considering the question, what of our work plan proposal felt unique, I will talk about our idea to sort of um, uh, use the energy and the community gathering that happens at our fourth plane community commons as a space for obvious data collection. So we have um, in our work plan, we've proposed like a six month uh, in-person data collection with in-person survey and soft qualitative feedback um, to occur at the community commons because community is already gathering there. And for a whole bunch of different reasons from kids' birthday parties to uh, small business events to 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 cultural events and programs. So we had the idea of using our um, uh, to of uh, recruiting a, a team of of uh, sort of outreach leaders or survey leaders from our community commons residents that live in the floors just north of our you know just on top of our community commons, and uh, because there's very low uh, transportation need, they just need to go downstairs to go and engage, and sort of deploying them at a minimum of six, potentially more depending on uh, the the time of each of the events to do some data collection at those point so because communities are already organically gathering there so that's what I'll say but we're, we're very 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 excited the fourth plane forward team we've been looking for different opportunities to start doing some more intensive data collection and this was one of those uh, like shared sister sort of needs between our organization what y'all need at the county and what the community needs to tell us awesome thank you Paris and so as all as y'all are listening to each other I uh, looking at those uh, those shared ideas. Let's go to Anna and Rose. Um, we decided to do um, surveys. Um, so we're going to be doing two surveys, one specifically for the youth. We have a group of um, roughly 100 Latinx students that we work with um, in both the Vancouver and Evergreen school districts. Um, and so we decided to do one specifically just to, to work with uh, or to get youth um, input on this. And then we decided to do a, another push, but for um, the adults in our community, um, we know that a lot of times our youth, since they are in school, they're more knowledgeable when it comes to um, the climate and you know more may know more of the key terms versus our um, elders. Um, so we are uh, doing two different ones and using social media to let folks know like, hey, we're going to be at Mercado Latino or hey, we're going to be at those really, uh, you know, hot spots where uh, where I go and, and our community congregates. Um, so that's the um, the path that, that Latino leadership is taking. Awesome. Thank you. Um, Alana? 
what um I think one we had a lot of ideas for our work plan, but one thing that we are excited about and hopefully you do is to collaborate with other Pacific Islander organizations, not only to have a big event, but also to incorporate our in-person survey so that we can get more data from our our communities and hopefully we will get what we need and hear their comments and suggestions and they can help us build what we need in the end. Thank you, Alana. Uh, Laura? Hey, everyone. Um, as a reminder, I'm with Council for the Homeless. And so my overall strategy is to um, survey folks uh, in sort of some different key stakeholder groups. Uh, so um, one will be a survey, an online survey of homeless service providers. And we'll do one survey for each phase, you know, of the, um, the, the project. So um, one on the, the the first one on the hazards, I believe, the second one on greenhouse gas emissions, and then um, on policy recommendations. Um, so there'll be three of those. Um, and then um, I've, I haven't decided yet, but it's gonna be some kind of survey in slash engagement conversation uh, for people who are living in emergency shelter. And um, uh, because people living in shelter have different experiences. And then another one will be um, a, a paper survey of 10 individuals who are experiencing unsheltered homelessness uh, that I'm hoping to work at in conjunction with our outreach workers on. And of course, we'll do everything we can throughout to share county information about this project via our agency newsletter and social media and and uh, all of the various ways that we can can help do that. So um, that is my initial work plan in a nutshell. Awesome, thank you, uh, uh, Gabriella. I know Gabriella was in a conference, so might have had to um, conference a little bit. Um, maybe. Me? Yep, please. Okay. All right. Let me see. Um, so my plan is <clears throat> so we have a community. Um we're running the uh a, a Saturday uh school here. So we got a lot of parents come in. So we're gonna plan into um have some staff there, um basically stationed then in the day that they come and uh, we'll get a survey data. And also we have a, um, a senior gathering in the community every two weeks. And so we will have people to come to uh, to collect data and answer questions. Um, also, um, we have different uh, temples and churches in, in the area too. And we, we got only uh, some of them. And so we will have some uh, staff to go, you know, get a little closer, um, talk with the, the people there. But also we are probably gonna do the, um, um, got information through our um, social network um, and then we have an email list of our members that we can actually uh, distribute so that's the plan that's awesome thank you Ben um, Aaron hello we are going to capture some of our youth voices with already existing events in person, as well as do some online surveys amongst other things, but we're excited about bringing in the youth voice. Right, thank you. Um, Rebecca, Catherine's clinic available? There we are, Rebecca. Yeah. Yeah, I've got it. Um, so we're also thinking about doing two sets of focus groups. So one around hazards and the other around greenhouse gases. And then at the, towards the end of the project, um, uh, we're throwing around the idea of doing some sort of maybe like an open house resource type event at our clinic. Um, again, hopefully partnering with a lot of you all just to get more people in the door and doing a more of a survey at that point um, to gather some input around um, policy ideas that have come about by that time. Awesome. Thank you. Uh, Danya? Mm 
Yes, um, for Sakura, so we're going to integrate um, it into our existing programs and our existing um, community sessions that we already have going on um, monthly. Um, so we're incorporating it into our Chukis language class, um, our cultural sewing, health and wellness, peer support group um, that we run every month, twice a month, and also four times a month. Um, we also have a Chukis community leader committee that meets once every month where we can also incorporate that into these meetings. Um, and then after those five sessions where I'm going to also have a bigger um, community led discussion um, towards the end of our time frame to kind of bring it all together. Awesome, thanks, Tanya. Monica? Hi, y'all. All right, so um, mine's a little long, but so in the, it's gonna be three um, events that this is gonna happen at. And um, there's gonna be, in the beginning, it's gonna be healing circles, a circle. Um, where um, we have uh, everyone around in chairs um, in a circle um, and everyone, so everyone can see each other. And we're going to be asking people to bring something that's a value to them, to the space. And we're going to put it all in the center so we can all see what each of us value, uh, whether it be a picture or an item. Um, and then we are going to have um, a, a board that has common values so we can see what we all value. And we're going to write those up there. Um, but it's uh, really what it's it's about is um, restorative justice, where we find our common values and then we talk about how do we use those common values to get what we want and need from our community. Uh, broken relationships within and between communities have led to broken economies, leading to broken communities, all in need of healing, not in need of fixing, in need of healing. And so you cannot heal if you are not if you have not been made whole. And so that's with truth, ra uh, ra uh, ra radical healing and transformation, a racial uh, racial healing and transformation. Um, and so uh, we need to create a sense of humanity so we can rebuild our village. And there's going to be translators in Spanish, Russian and Chukis and hopefully more. And then there's going to be an introduction of um, of uh, the uh uh, of nobody should be left falling short of um, life's essential needs, um, like housing and food. Um, but then we need to not go beyond our uh, boundaries of our mother earth. Um, and so with that, there's gonna be art, painting, drawing. And so at the first event, there's gonna be climate resilience policies. We're gonna draw that out. We're gonna, we're gonna see what that comes out with all the art. Second event is gonna be the greenhouse gas reduction. The third one is ask what we are missing. And then after all that, there's going to be food and dancing without any shoes so we can be connected to our Mother Earth um, and we can feel her spirit um, within us and through us. And um, so there, and we wait to the end for food so people stick around. So, yeah, <laughs> uh, just going to be a really fun all day event. And so very excited for that. Awesome. Thank you, Monica. Uh, Patricia? All right. Hi. Hi. Sorry there for a second. It takes a second for it to approve my audio on my computer. We gotcha. So we're planning a few sets of meetings for several different groups. Since our Farm Food Justice Network encompasses everyone who eats food, um, as well as many people who grow and have land resources to provide for food, and since farms and anyone who eats food are all impacted by any change in climate, we cover pretty broad range of people. And in addition to the meetings we have set, we also hope to collaborate a lot with the other EJC members to kind of meet all of their additional um, outreaches, because I think that one of the biggest parts of food and farming and justice is, is bringing that food equity inclusion to everyone as well. Mm -hmm. Having access to local food is probably the most important resource for, for me as far as feeding the soul and the community. Um, I think we set up a few kind of scattered surveys in between some of our meetings so that we could also see 
what were people's intentions beyond what they received at the meeting and how we can move forward to kind of identify those farm groups and what is needed for like land access and land access equities and clearer zoning things that could potentially help to bring some justice perspectives into what we're um, trying to accommodate for growth of our community in a way that isn't just growth for development, but also growth for protecting those um, spaces, which we all hold, hold sacred. So um, I'm pretty excited about bringing this opportunity for most of my members to the table and facilitating an opportunity to have open conversation about where we can go um, with our community and building those bridges between where there is a bunch of gaps for the community to have access to all of the parts um, as far as food and as far as equity and and combining that conversation. So we're out here doing a lot of work that involves a lot of greenhouse gas reduction work. We're doing the emission carbon sequestering. We're doing the hard work that people are you know promoting and talking about, but we're not getting any support. And I think we have to figure out a way where we can work together to get that support via, you know, the community, the county health department. And it's been so great so far to get a lot of guidance from everybody um, in our conversations. So um, if there are more specific things, I'd, I'd love people to reach out and ask questions and we look forward to working together on it all. That's awesome. Thank you, Patricia. Um, Lavita. Yes, hello. I'm just typing my notes here in, in the chat so I can have my overview of what we're going to do. Um, yeah, so I don't know if my uh, video is working or not. but We can see you, so I think it's working. <laughs> I can't see me, so I don't know. <laughs> well, hopefully I look okay. Anyways, what we're going to do is five types of input gathering tasks. We're going to do um, our women's mosaic, which focuses on health. Um, we have done quite a bit of work in looking into like health equity and health outcomes for women. And so there is this overlap where climate impacts or climate issues are impacting health. And we're so what we want to do is find someone who can talk a little bit about that, talk to that or talk to the, the scope of climate issues as it relates to women's health. And we're going to put that on our radio show. So um, I think that there may be some spaces of collaboration and helping define um, a good guest who could speak to that. And then the second thing is uh, we have a Black women's uh, peer support group, uh, which is called the Angelou's Angels. And so that gives us a unique opportunity to take that group and have it serve as a focus group for one of their meetings, which is the last Thursday of every month. Then the third thing is that we want to do in-person interviews, focusing on representation from unsheltered houseless folks and brown and Black um, women caretakers. Uh, we do free hot soup, which is a twice weekly um, meal distribution center outside the share house and by the railroad tracks and a couple other encamp encampments. So uh, because we have established relationships there, we're, we're looking at uh, working with some field reporters to uh, do some in-person conversational type of interviews for part of our interviews. And then the other um, interviewees will be um, recruit it through um, other channels or other events. And then of course, we're gonna do surveys where they'll be in person and online. We have a lot of upcoming uh, events uh, on our own, for example, Juneteenth, the Women's Tea, and uh, probably a few more down the road that I'm, I can't even think of at this moment. But those will give us great opportunities to do um, in-person surveys, or at least have some laptops or uh, tablets set up so that people who are in those events can go online and do the virtual survey. And then of course, uh, we'll use our social media channels to post um, opportunities to join surveys and other focus groups and interviews. And then lastly, uh, we are working with a Vancouver Public Schools intern from I think Vancouver High School. And so we, as her major work project, because she's as like a generalist um, intern, we want to um, have a youth community uh, conversation on um, that aligns with one of the phases, depending on the time. So whatever is the phase in May, that's what we'll be doing. So we want to help this youth figure out how to do community organizing, how to facilitate a conversation. So it's both professional development, but it's also furthering this um, this initiative while 
um, including you know future generations. So those are our five. That's great. Thank you. And then Jude, I don't know if your mic was working or if you want to throw in the chat something you want to lift up. Angela, did we get you, Angela? You did not. Yes, jump in. Of course. So for us, we are uh we are implementing um things that we've already done in the past. So surveys, uh online surveys, hopefully they will get translated into Chukis and the other Pacifica languages that we have um, here in Clark County. Uh, but as much as we do want our community to uh, fill out our surveys, we do also want to hear their voices. So we're, um, we're also implementing focus groups for the community to be able to give them a, a, a safe space for them to uh, speak on any uh, barriers that they feel uh, in in Clark County. That's it. Thank you. Thank you, Angela. Josh, welcome. Can I bring you in? So you came at a perfect time. You can introduce yourself and then if you want to give a highlight of your engagement. Uh, Absolutely. I've been I've been sitting Ben. I've been sitting as a as a viewer as opposed to a, a panelist. So oh, sorry about I'll, that. Uh, I'll jump in real quick. Josh Jones, Partners and Careers. Um, we're going to be uh, providing a combination of uh, social media outreach and in-person outreach to our clientele. Um, we have a diversity of clientele throughout the community, um, but I think our, our target area for, for this grant is um, our immigrant and refugee population, which currently is primarily Eastern European, that being Ukrainian and Russian. Um, we do have a, a, a fairly good population of Middle Eastern immigrants and refugees, as well as uh, Latin and Central American. But um, we'll be focusing and providing social media outreach and then those in-person um, kind of conversations, outreach, um, doing poll survey with them um, to gather feedback and then translating materials for those clientele that we serve as well. That's awesome. Thank you, Josh. And sorry to leave you out there in the audience. And uh, oh, oh, no, it's all good. Good to have you in the room. Okay, well, we're a little bit behind, folks. Did I? Did we get everybody, though? Jude, I think your mic wasn't working. Hi, it didn't go. Oh, Gabriella, that's right. Sorry, Gabriella, jump in. <laughs> I called on you. I think you were. we said we were conferencing, and I forgot to come back. So please, jump in. That's okay. Uh, yeah, actually, uh, when you call in, I had somebody on the phone. So sorry about that. No, no problem. So the um, the conversations that we're having about this outreach um, so far is going to be online and in person. And the focus is going to be on, uh, because we focus on people, families with children with intellectual and mental disabilities, it's going to be around health and also food um, that the families have access to. So we are still we are uh, still waiting to see about the questions that we're going to ask and the so the engagement is going to be online and in person so we can have a more broader reach to all those community because not everybody can do in person uh, gathering so we're going to do both online and in person but as more things um Cam, the questions and and whatnot, then we're going to develop a more solid plan about uh, the outreach we're going to do. Thank you. Thank you, Gabriela. So Jude, I don't know if your mics work, but we'll give a last call or if you can throw it in the chat. Um, so I know I had framed this initially, but I think our time is going to force us to do some of this offline. So. Hopefully, as you all heard, and, and maybe I'll look to you, Clark County um, folks, are the engagement plans when finally is going to be shared amongst the team or posted online or anything? Um, I guess we ha we hadn't thought specifically yet about that, but I think uh, we would, yeah, be glad to figure out a way to share so everyone can see um, what's, what's being planned. Um, so anyway, we haven't figured out the exact mechanism to do that, but would be glad to figure out a way to do that. 
Okay, great, thanks. So what I'll, what I'll ask in the meantime is you all just sitting with what you heard from your peers and colleagues around the table, and if there was um, either an opportunity or, or an idea that you heard, um, please reach out directly. Of course, reminding yourself that it's not a reply to all of, you know, stay out of the uh, serial communication public meetings rules. Uh, but certainly if something came up for you, they're like, wow, I, that seems like a good partnership. I think Patricia, you named it very explicitly. Paris, I heard you thinking about maybe, you know, oh, that seems like a good um, way to partner um, and others named hope for collaboration and opportunity. So thank you all. I'm, I'm super excited to see um, this work manifest. So we're going to move pretty quickly to the next part of our agenda and what today will ultimately end up being as an introduction to this tool that we're gonna to have to create. And we'll get some, some initial thinking, get your brains moving a little bit, but I really do wanna honor Dana and Zachary being here. There's a, a lot of content to get through, and it's also really important for some of the initial engagement concepts and ideas that you all will be working with um, to, to talk with community for. So. Um, just with that, we're gonna we'll spend probably next 15 minutes or so, give or take, and then we'll we'll take a break. But Jenna, why don't you kick us off and start the conversation? I'll provide a little framing, and then we'll open it up to the group. Sounds good. Okay, so um, I wanted to revisit um, some of the background information that we shared at our last meeting um, on this project, and um, specifically, I. Uh, put on this slide excerpts from this new climate bill that um, are using equity related language. So uh, that's what's on the slide here. Um, and I, um, I'll just highlight sort of key, key phrasing on this slide that stands out to me. So for the overall climate change and uh, resiliency goal that's now been added uh, to the Growth Management Act, it says that um, we need to ensure that comprehensive plans advance environmental justice. And when the legislation talks specifically about uh, creation of new climate um, elements in comprehensive plans, um, it uses language that says that we must avoid creating or worsening localized climate impacts to vulnerable populations and overburdened communities. Um, and in the part of the bill where it's talking specifically about this greenhouse gas sub-element we need to create it uses language that says we must identify actions that will prioritize greenhouse gas reductions that benefit overburdened communities in order to maximize the co-benefits of reduced air pollution and environmental justice. And the resilience sub-element language in the legislation says we must include goals, policies, and programs designed to identify, protect, and enhance community resiliency to climate change impacts, including social, economic, and built environment factors that support adaptation to climate impacts consistent with environmental justice. Um, and then the legislation also provides, you know, added into law definitions for what it considers an overburdened community, environmental justice, and vulnerable populations. Um, and I will also add this, this new climate legislation also added environmental justice terminology to actually a few other places in the Growth Management Act, not specifically tied to climate, uh, but it was actually part of this, this bill as well. But on this slide here are the key excerpts, the key language that relate to climate change planning that the county um, has to follow. And to me, I, I wanted to share this because I, I described this at a high level at our last meeting, but to me, this is really clear that the county has to do these things. This isn't optional. Um, it's not, this isn't consider doing these things. This is a Hey County, you have to do this. And um, as someone who's worked in planning for a while, this is pretty significant. I, I have not seen language like this um, in the Growth Management Act before. Like this is this is a, a new thing. And um, it's anyway, so I just wanted to, I can't reiterate that enough, but <laughs> to me, this is a big deal as someone who looks at these laws, you know, on a regular basis. Um, so let's go to the, so I wanted to revisit the law, but let's go to the next slide. Okay, so we also, we shared this slide at our last meeting, which is providing a high level overview of the um, decision making process for this project. And um, wanted to sort of shift the conversation from, so we have this legislation that says, you know, you have to um, improve environmental justice in your community. 
Um, but we want to start the conversation of, so how are we going to do that? How will we know if the policies that we're proposing are actually going to improve um, things in our community? So um, we put a, a star here on the, on the slide to, um, to highlight sort of a key point in the, in the process that we'll be going through together. So um, at some point, we're going to get, we'll have gotten enough feedback that we will have some draft policy ideas for consideration. And that's when we're going to want to use an equity lens to help evaluate those policies. Um, and our hope is that um, whatever this lens, whatever it ends up being, um, that it can help inform feedback for next steps. So maybe we'll run a policy through a lens and it's going to become really clear this policy is really not equitable in these ways. Maybe that should be dropped off the list. Or maybe this policy, you know, it's doing a lot of really good things um, in terms of improving equity in our community and improving environmental justice. Can we prioritize that policy somehow? Um, so this, this equity lens we're talking about, we're hoping will really be a really valuable tool in, um, in providing feedback to the policy development process before uh, final policy recommendations move forward. Okay, so I'm going to now pass it back to Ben. Thanks, Jonas. So I'm going to fly through some stuff, y'all, and hopefully um, this doesn't feel super new. Uh, so if we go to the next slide, um, and, and I know I, I met with a lot of y'all, and, and just reminding folks if I didn't share it, um, you know, I actually kind of grew up in environmental justice organizing, so I was a little baby organizer doing work in the, the late 90s. Um, I spent a number of years with Multnomah County in environmental public health, and I served as a chief diversity and equity officer. So these core principles that are laid here, you could find in lots of different places, but it's really, you know, it's literally from an old slide that I pulled that I've been using for a number of years to try to talk about environmental justice and equity through um, a lens of principles. And so particularly related as to, to this project and directly to connect it to what Jenna just was describing as the have to. Um, you know, I really think about these principles of the distribution of resources and opportunities when we think about equity, when we think about economic, relational, and social systems that sus are sustainable over time, but also stay sustainable across populations largely connected to your work, right? The meaningful engagement of, of communities of color and other populations that have been marginalized in, in process and decision-making and evaluation. And then really trying to have bold and courageous conversations and vision and leadership around the root causes of disparities. And if we go to the next slide, um, there's a way to start in illustrating kind of what do we see as the outcome? And this is adapted from Prevention Institute. It's been around for a long time and there's lots of different kind of ways that we could expand these boxes. I will note the, the, the arrows go both ways. And I think as you all are thinking about the questions that we need to be asking as we develop this tool, um, ensuring that we're thinking about this work at every single level, right? From the root factors of things like racism, poverty, discrimination, lack of power, immigration status, housing status, whatever those those root causes are, all the way down to those individual behaviors, right? Your food choices or access to food, um, um, things like your ability to, to recycle um, and how often we do that, energy streams, waste streams, et cetera. Right. So as we think about this continuum, these are all areas that you all um, and this work to build out a climate element may have touch points in each of these different boxes. And so as we develop a equity lens, recognizing that as policies get developed, we're trying to counter the things that contributed to inequities and lift up the things that contribute to equity and equitable outcome. So if we go to the next slide. And this is a, um, it's both reference in the commerce guidance and, and you'll see we're, we're really trying to be intentional and Jenna did a great job of lifting out and continues to help us think about the different sections in the guidance that's coming from um, 
from commerce to, to, to align with this work very intentionally. And one of those frames uh, really sourced um, from, a, from an old friend and mentor, John Powell. Um, I actually think it's the Haas Center for Othering and Belonging now. That's how old this slide is. But he's been talking about targeting universalism for some time. And there's kind of two pieces of this slide that are important. One that um, about the left side of this slide that we, and the slide before it, right? That those structural inequities, those differences in opportunity and access to resources produces different outcomes, right? We all know that. What our kind of collective obligation is, is to try to build tools that help us, as John would say, understand unique populations relationship to the social fabric, right? If we don't understand what prevents different populations from reaching um, their, their full success or thriving, um, then it's really hard to develop solutions that are gonna work for community. And so what targeted universalism is really demanding is that we have a universal goal. So in this, that, right, that first bullet, that it sustains, it's sustainable and sustains all people, right? We're not trying to develop a climate element that just sustains middle income, right? white folks living in these neighborhoods. Uh, right? We're really looking at policies that are going to serve our entire community. But unless we have a way to understand how a policy might create or confront a barrier for particular populations, we're not going to be able to do that effectively. So that's a very short version of a um, something that he's put a lot of work into. Let's go to the next slide. So we're going to, this is going to be part one of a conversation, right? And so Part of, as we said at the beginning, part of your role as a group is to develop and design an equity lens, an environmental justice lens upon which we can both meet that statutory obligation that Jenna um, was laying out, right? We have to consider environmental justice impacts for overburdened communities, vulnerable populations, and our job is to make it real, right? What does it mean to... to design in that way and how do we hold accountable collectively right to the policies and make sure we have some level analysis so there's three ways that we'll be thinking about this and this is built from uh, lots of other tools that have been designed around the country but at its essence this lens is asking us to think about three large buckets of work uh, or, or of analysis one people right so one of the questions we're going to ask you, and we actually have a Jamboard. We really don't have a lot of time today, but maybe we can share it for our folks around the table and you can start populating this. Um, if you're comfortable with the Jamboard, I'll ask you also to just reflect um, out loud. So there's kind of several pieces, right? So people and really thinking about, I think we lost our slides, but I don't know where they're. Where they're headed. So people are like, what are the questions that we would need to ask? And I say we, you all need to design for the CAG and for the, the county, right? As it's, as folks are developing policies and strategies, what are the things we need to ask and consider for to ensure that climate impacts don't disproportionately harm vulnerable populations, right? What are the questions that we would need to ask? When we ask about and think about place and space, again, using the language from guidance, what are the questions that need, we need to ask so we're not contributing or worsens, worsening localized climate impacts for already overburdened populations and communities? And then process directly connected to you all, right? Is this the intersection between what are the questions that we can ask to ensure that as this process unfolds, the information that you're gathering, that the county's gathering, that is coming into this work, that the CAG is bringing forward and other partners, right, that we have utilized effectively community input and data that helps inform that overall goal. I'm going to pause there because I know I just rambled at you for a few minutes. So there's you know what, we'll probably just have to come back to this. So what I'm gonna say because of our time for today, and Nicole, I can almost see you scrambling behind the scenes. So I'm gonna tell you, don't scramble anymore. Um, I wanna just open it up if there's any questions or reflections based on the few slides I shared. And then what I'm gonna ask 
as part of your reflection coming out of tonight is to actually start thinking about these questions. So we're going to design a process. We'll probably use some mixed methods in our next meeting to say, okay, so now that we understand what we're trying to achieve, what do we need to ask? What are the filters that a policy is going to have to go through in order to account for this opportunity and obligation that you have right? to consider and to avoid and to mitigate and to ensure right, that you're that the policies aren't creating further harm. So why don't I stop? We're gonna take a break, but let's open it up for any, what's coming up for you? Questions, thoughts, comments, concerns, initial reactions. Gabriella? Yeah. Uh, I just wanna say, um... I need to leave for the convening, but I will look forward for the email to check on the recording. And um, if you want us to submit uh, some of those questions via email, I'll be happy to do that since it looks okay. like I'll miss that part. Thank you, Gabriella. Yeah, thank you. So I know you had to go, so I appreciate, appreciate you doing that. Aaron, I see your comment in the chat. Um, what is most important to you and what are you most concerned about? If we can, we're gonna copy and paste reminder if you're using chat, just send it to everyone. Uh, yep, same conference. Paris, jump in. We can't, I can't hear you, Paris. Oh gosh, oh, I go. forgot to drop this stupid thing. Sorry, my bad. Um, one of the things that's coming up for me is this this tension that I'm feeling between community level of of uh, understanding and education around these these subject matter pieces and how like maybe understanding how day to day or or larger even it does directly impact them in their community um and, and then doing the engagement piece so i feel that our engagement will be better supported by by education and understanding of the of the issues at hand so that community can truly consider so that's sort of what i'm grappling is is how can we twofold like both educate and and do this data collection that is so so very critically needed um yeah just something i'm using about thank y'all yeah no thanks paris and that's going to be a real um question we're going to come back to also after the next part of our agenda, right? How do you take what can feel either complex or dense, or I don't know what the words are. I don't wanna put words in other people's mouths, but how do you take lots of information and condense it down in a way that's accessible to the community that you know, yeah, Paris. I do want to be cleared and clarify that I apply a very strong asset-based view on our community. So it's not that I don't believe that it's too too complicated for folks to understand. It's just that I know that these folks got two, three, multiple jobs. They're time strapped and capacity strapped, and you know, being able to spend time in informational spaces or 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 getting updates via news can sometimes be. Uh, there can be a gap there, but I just do want to make it very clear. It's not that I don't believe our community can, can you know, for, understand this information. It's just how can I equitably and best share the information so that they can give us the best feedback back about what we need to know for their community. But appreciate y'all. Yeah, no, thank you for for correcting my use of language that was deficit. Um, so I appreciate you just naming that very explicitly because we are going to come back to that conversation. How do we bring things effectively to community that are um, experiencing exactly what you just described? Monica? Yes, so to the first one of the uh, people, um, who are the vulnerable populations is one. What are the specific vulnerabilities of these groups? Like consider factors like Social, socioeconomic status and access to resources and things of that nature. Also, how are climate change impacts affecting these vulnerabilities? Also, what adaptation measure, measures are in place or needed? Also, how can local knowledge and traditional practices be integrated into adaptation strategies? And are there disparities in access to resources and decision-making processes? Uh, what are the potential cascading impacts on social, economic, and environmental systems? 
and how can we foster community engagement and empowerment? And then also, I just, yeah, I wanted to look further into those other questions too, but that's first on that one, on the first one. Thank I love, you. That was, uh, thank you, Monica. That was good modeling for um, the conversation I think we hope to have um, going forward. So I'm, I'm gonna be sensitive to the time because we have, um, if there's any anything else burning, otherwise I'm going to ask us to take a break and then bring our our friends uh, Dana and Zachary back in because we have a lot more to cover and a, a deep conversation that I know we have, want to have with you all that's going to inform your engagement. So, any other reflections for today? And we'll we'll give some do some work between meeting to help uh, everyone feel like we can have a robust conversation when we come back together. Okay, hope's good with ten minutes. Let's take, uh, it's 5.11 on my clock. Let's come out at 5.21 and then we'll have Dana and Zachary jump right in. All right, see you in 10. Yeah. Sorry, I was trying to fix my computer. <laughs>
Then are you co-host yet? Let's see. No. Okay. We'll make sure that happens. Okay, thanks. I'm seeing how my look at Jen, I switched to goldfish instead of cheese sets. I'm mixing and matching my cheese flavored crackers. <laughs> Nicole, I don't have that authority, do I? Grant's the only one who has the authority to do that. God. One sec. The color is Yeah, okay. Um, Grant's back, we'll make that happen. Um, at 521, though, Dana, you and Zachary maybe introduce yourselves. And hopefully by that time. Sure thing. We all are in our 10 minute break. 520 on a Monday. Whatever his idea this was to have a late evening meeting on the first day of the week. <laughs> Our collective blame, I guess, right? Is that we all share this responsibility. <laughs> Perfect. Okay. Well, it's 521, so um, a thumbs up or camera on, some mechanism to know that you're back in the room with us is great. Back. Okay. All right. Thank you. Um, let's, Grant, are you back? We lost Grant in the wilderness, perhaps. So, well, Dana, why don't you and Zachary open us up and then um, we'll sort the tech on our end to make you a host. Okay, I'm actually able to get in there now, Ben. So we're good on, on screen share. Um, so, Great. yay. <laughs> Hi, everyone. Um, my name is Dana Hellman. I'm the Resilience Manager with Kappa Strategies. We're a climate adaptation consultancy that's working on the climate resiliency sub element of this project. And Zachary, do you want to introduce yourself quickly and then I'll pull up the slides? Of course, yeah. I'm Zachary Boyce. I am lead geospatial analyst at Kappa Strategies, working with Dana on this project. All right. So give me just a second here to get my slides rolling. This is always the most awkward transition from. Uh, Talking to slide sharing. Okay, can everyone see, although it doesn't look like it's in presentation mode. Okay, is that in presentation mode? Jenna, can you thumbs up me if you can see it? I can see you. Okay, perfect, thank you. All right, so um, just a little bit of summary here about what um, the Kappa consultant team is working on and what we're gonna talk to you about today. Uh, as you all know, House Bill 1181 requires that Clark County introduce this climate resilience sub-element. And I have a just a quick definition of resilience here, if helpful, which is out of the Department of Commerce guidance. And it's the ongoing process of um, anticipating, preparing for, and adapting to changes in climate and minimizing negative impacts to our natural systems, infrastructure, and communities. So, um, Another way to think about that more simply is we're looking through this climate resiliency sub-element for opportunities to make communities more prepared for and more able to bounce back from climate-related stress. And this is a, a kind of high-level overview of how we'll be interacting with this group, the Environmental Justice Coalition, over the next several months. We're currently in this phase called Exploring Climate Impacts. So today we're going to do an introduction, a very brief introduction, admittedly, um, to some climate hazards, assets, and impacts. But we can continue this conversation uh, kind of offline and um, as you're developing community engagement plans. In April, we'll look at opportunities to pair up specific climate hazards and assets and look at how climate change might impact each pair. 
Um, also in April, we're going to look for kind of a deeper understanding of how people are impacted by climate change. So looking for some narratives and storytelling. And we'll also ask you to help us identify priority climate hazards that should be included in the planning for unincorporated Clark County moving forward. Um, and then in May, we're moving on to another phase of the work called Assess Vulnerability and Risk. And so we'll ask for your feedback on that and make sure that we're framing risk and vulnerability in a way that makes sense. And then finally in June, and actually May and June, um, we're not exactly sure how this will play out, but there's gonna be a process of back and forth happening between the EJC and also the Community Advisory Group. And we're hoping that the EJC can make sure that any recommendations for goals and policies that are coming out of the Community Advisory Group are um, meeting the environmental justice criteria. So in our presentation today, we're really gonna hone in on hazards and potential impacts. I have in the left-hand column here, under climate hazards, these are some hazards that we are proposing um, to include in our work moving forward. And we're open to feedback on these, but um, this is a list of climate hazards. In the middle there, you can see um, a list of kind of comparable hazards that show up in the county's natural hazard mitigation plan. It's not a perfect one-to-one -one match. For example, severe weather is a hazard in the mitigation plan, but we're looking at it as two separate climate hazards, extreme heat and also storms. Uh, and then in that column on the right, you can get a look at how the county's hazard mitigation plan currently ranks these different hazards. So severe weather is a high priority. And again, that includes extreme heat and storms. And then flooding is also standing out as being a fairly high priority for the county. Uh, and then one thing to keep in mind as we're talking through these hazards, we're going to go through uh, one at a time, but I'd like to remind folks that hazards, these climate hazards are all interrelated, um, so there's a lot of interaction potentially happening between them. And so one example on the top left, you can see there there's a real relationship between extreme heat and drought, kind of working together to dry out the environment and create conditions that are really fruitful for a wildfire to burn. Um, similarly, we can see on the bottom right, if you have storms coming through with a lot of heavy precipitation, that can lead to an increase in flooding and possibly lead to landslides as well. So just a reminder that these hazards can happen multiple at one time. And what we may see then are some kind of overlapping compounding impacts. Um, also wanna just flag, especially as this group is focused on environmental justice, that social factors can really play a role in um, what kinds of climate impacts we see. And Monica started to get at this earlier, uh, very clearly, thanks Monica, for kind of priming this. Um, one thing is we know that low income populations, marginalized populations are very often more exposed to climate hazards and that has a lot to do with past planning decisions. So um, one example we can use is low income housing development in a floodplain, which means that those houses are more likely to experience flooding inside the house. Um, another example is redlining, which is a historical process of housing discrimination in the US, where non-white home buyers were intentionally concentrated in specific neighborhoods that were considered to be in decline. Um, and as a result, what we now see today is that formerly redlined neighborhoods tend to be uh, a lot hotter in the summer, have way less green space, um, less tree cover than non-redline neighborhoods. So there's a real planning uh, relationship at play there. Another thing that might uh, come into play here, so some hazards are going to affect everyone simultaneously. So a good example of that is wildfire, smoke. Uh, that could be touching everyone in a single city all at the same time. But some people will be more vulnerable to that hazard because of physical sensitivity. So um, if they have any pre-existing conditions that make them more likely to experience injury or illness because of climate hazards. So uh, one other example there is if you're someone who has asthma, you'll be more sensitive to wildfire smoke, uh, just as an example. And then the third is adaptive capacity. And that refers to an individual's ability to cope with climate hazards and to either avoid 
danger and avoid impacts altogether or to recover more quickly when they encounter a climate hazard. So some examples of that would be disposable income, strong social networks, and access to insurance, including health insurance and home insurance. So, okay, that's all on hazards set up, but I, and I know this table is enormous. Um, you don't have to read it all right now. It's gonna come up again <laughs> as we have our, our conversations over the next several weeks and months. But another thing we wanna think about in addition to hazards is assets. So um, what, what are the resources and the facilities in our communities that we, um, that might be affected by climate change and that we might want to protect from climate change. And I'll just note um, the sectors. So in the left-hand column, you'll see there's 11 sectors there. Those are sectors that are required by the Department of Commerce that we kind of frame things around these sectors. So in a few minutes, when Zachary starts talking about climate projections um, and potential impacts, he'll be framing impacts around these various sectors. And, oh, I'm talking so fast, sorry. Uh, <laughs> when, um, before I turn it over to Zachary to talk about climate hazards and projections, I'd also just like to say, we're about to share a lot of maps and data with you. <laughs> um, it's gonna be a lot of information in a short time. And we're doing that because we wanna show you like what, what the projections say and what's on the horizon for Clark County. Um, but I also want to point out that, you know, the in the larger context of our meeting today, we, we're really here to talk about the experiences of you and your communities, what you value, what your concerns are. And so, and this is also just the beginning of a, of a long conversation. So please don't feel like you have to take in all of this information that we're about to throw at you. <laughs> I just want to set you up a little bit because it's it might be a lot. All right. With that, Zachary, I'm going to turn it on over to you. Wonderful. Thanks, Dana. Yeah, you, you said it, so I didn't have to, but brace yourselves, uh, buckle up. <laughs> We're going to look at a lot of data. It, it could be a little overwhelming. I encourage you during this process to take notes as you have questions. Uh, and then at the end, if, if you have those questions, I'm, I'm happy to address uh, all of them one by one. So first off, we're just going to get a general overview. Um, the primary source of data for our hazard analysis was a web dashboard that was built by the University of Washington Climate Impact Group. And you can see a link to that up on the slides. You will have access to these slides afterwards. If we just look to the right of that, we'll see the, the tool itself. Um, one thing you might notice is that the first drop down box is about selecting a county. So this, uh, uh, this table is county wide in, in its assessment. Uh, so when you bring up any data, it's going to give you the entire county wide. What we did for this process in particular is to only consider the unincorporated areas of Clark County. Um, so the little rectangles that you see in green. Uh, on the right side of the map are indicating a, a value uh, associated with each of them. We, we call those rasters, um, which is one just one of the kind of data that we can end up putting on maps. Um, a helpful illustration I would find is like the lines are uh, representing Clark County outline are one type of data, and then this other type of data is raster data. So it's just rectangles that contain one value. And in this case, those values are percent change or probability data uh, or, or uh, something similar to that. Um, so the scenario that is being considered in this case is called the high emission scenario or RCP 8.5. It can be quite intimidating um, to hear relative concentration pathways, but what we're talking about is just the level of CO2 that's uh, in the sort in the atmosphere. And depending on how how we project that into the future, it affects the sort of projections that we make um, in these different climate metrics. So we're do doing the high emissions business as usual, which means little or no change to the amount of carbon that we're putting in the atmosphere via burning fossil fuels and things like that. 
Um, and then the time uh, frame that we're looking at uh, because of the legislation uh, is the 2020 to 2049 time period. So we're looking at a 30 year um, period, often in comparison to a previous period, which is called the historical normal. Um, and so the normal just means 30 years before that, right? So we're looking at this little window that we're in, which is 30 years, and then we want to compare it to what happened in the previous 30 years. Next slide, please. All right. Now, this is going to seem like a dense technical concept, but I promise it's super easy. Um, so you'll see the, the map on the left. We have the same sort of rectangles that we were dealing with before. We have three little values. You'll also see a black outline in the middle of the map. You can see that these green squares don't evenly overlap with that uh, polygon, with that outline of a jurisdiction. And so what we have to do is, is fix that so that they're equally distributed between, um, between the different uh, levels of overlap, right? So you can see in the bottom left corner, it, that's taking up upwards of like 90%. 87% if you want to be precise of the space. And so we have to assign that uh, a different weight in order to come up with a value that makes more sense. So if we take the, the raw mean or the, the average of all of these numbers, we'd get 5.8 or negative 5.8 change. And then when we correct for that, uh, we bump that down a little bit because we can see that negative 4.9 is taking up a much larger uh, section of, the, uh, of that outline. Uh, Lastly, we took this uh, quadrant approach. So we divided the county up into four sections, uh, northwest, northeast, southwest, southeast, um, to show you a little better the distribution of these hazards through space. Um, we do have the unincorporated area-wide estimate, but we feel it's important to look where that is uh, concentrated for the basis of comparison. Next slide, please. All right, so uh, we're jumping right in here. We have this demo slide that, that tells you the anatomy of what we're going to be looking at. So up at the very top, we see our hazard, in this case, drought. Uh, one down, we're seeing the climate metric and what it's measured in. So what kind of number are we going to be looking at below? Um, below that, we see the change indicator arrows, so positive or negative, what, it, what this looks like uh, into the future based on the scenario that we're looking at uh, over the next 30 years. And then below that, we have a visual output that can often be easier to understand that you can rapidly visualize what, what the picture uh, looks like in, in the county and countywide. Uh, lastly, we have the map legend, which will give you an idea of where the low values are and where the high values are. That will change a little bit between slides, depending on the hazard, um, but you'll always be uh, able to consult that legend and you'll, like I said, have access to these slides afterwards. Uh, go ahead, Dina. All right, let me just catch up here. All right, the first uh, hazard we want to look at is drought, and the first metric associated with that is late summer precipitation. Uh, and that is measured in percent change in total precipitation from July until September. So we're looking at those really hot months where in Clark County and the Pacific Northwest at large, we often see less uh, precipitation. Uh, so we want to see how, how much less that would be under these climate impacts. So just taking a quick glance at the map, we're seeing a concentration of values in the northeast or the second quadrant. Um, and then always, if you, if you want to consult what the total unincorporated area might experience, we can look at this area wide arrow at the very right. And we can see on average across the whole area, we're dealing with a negative 7% uh, change. So that means there, there will be a 7% decrease in late summer precipitation, which has implications, as Dana noted before, in other hazards and, and can, can drive those impacts. Next slide, please. The next thing that we'll look at is precipitation doubt, which is a much more drought, which uh, is a much longer view um, uh, sort of metric, right? So that is the likelihood or probability of uh, summer precip precipitation, so rain, uh, below 75% of that historical normal that I talked about uh, before we started dealing with all this data. So 30 years before, and then we're looking at 30 years in the present and the very near future. Um, these values in these blue circles can be read as percent values. And so across the entire area, 
we're seeing a 31%. That's a good way of looking at it. So we have a 31% chance year over year um, that in the next 30 years, we will have precipitation that is below 75% what we would expect to have seen in the previous 30 years. That's a long sentence. Uh, I'm happy to explain more uh, at, at the end if it's helpful. Next slide, please. Lastly, with drought uh, as a hazard, we want to look at the impacts um, that are visited upon the region. Uh, drought is, a, is an interesting hazard in and of itself. It, it operates on different time scales. You can measure it within a week or two weeks, and you can measure it in a multi-year scheme, right? So that short-term impact, we're not seeing a huge impact on human health and, 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 and things like that. But uh, in the short term, we are seeing ecological impacts. We're seeing, obviously, farming, agricultural impacts, uh, some economic development, uh, depending on how you look at that, and then ecosystem impacts. Uh, we, we see uh, decreases in water supply, and then with that decrease, a heating of the water supply. Next slide, please. All right, and so the next hazard we're looking at is extreme heat. And then the first metric that we're going to look at is 90 degrees Fahrenheit, uh, max humidex days. Humidex seems like a fancy word. If you've ever heard heat index, it's a lot like that. So it's a combination of heat measured heat in the atmosphere and then also the water that's in the atmosphere as well. So humidity, so heat and humidity. The only difference between heat index and humidex is that it's based on a lower standard. So across, um, across the region, we're looking at this metric as a change in days over a 30 year period. Right, so these fractional decimals aren't going to make as much of a difference, but again, let's just uh, look at the last number and say, on average, area wide, we're looking at about a 20 day uh, increase in the number of days above 90 degrees, which could have real material impacts on human health and other industries. Next slide, please. Next thing that we'll look at is hot days. And uh, that is defined as change in number of days above 100 degrees Fahrenheit. As we can see from this map, we're seeing a hyper localized uh, representation. So we're only looking at Clark County, whereas there is a statewide, um, there's statewide data that, that is showing you a variation from this low, low value to a very high value. Uh, and in this case, it's a little, it's a little, I guess, misleading is what I would say, right? Like we, we see a marginal increase, but that shouldn't say like, oh, we're not going to see any days above 100 degrees. Uh, it might not depart over a 30 year span from the previous 30 years, but that doesn't mean events uh, that we would call anomalous previously, like the 2021 heat dome, uh, are prevented from happening under these climate scenarios. Next slide, please. All right, so in just looking at those impacts, um, again, we, we this is a near-term study. And so in that near-term spirit, we're thinking about uh, human health, we're thinking about uh, drought, we're thinking about um, fire conditions being exacerbated, which is posing risk to property uh, and also ecosystems, the heating up of water and the affecting of uh, salmon populations, which are of cultural value, of course. Uh, and water resources uh, being affected as well. Next slide, please. All right, I'm going to take a breath, recenter. Uh, <laughs> I encourage everyone. Uh, flooding uh, is our next hazard, and then we're going to look at a couple metrics for that. The first one being total annual precipitation. So we're looking across the region, and we're we're seeing again. Let's rely on that area-wide number first before we get into the greater uh, detail or the, the close up. And that area wide value is a, a positive 4.5% change. So we're seeing across the entire year versus what we saw with the drought, uh, late summer precipitation, a uh, decrease across the board. We're seeing an increase across the board in the year long total annual pre precipitation. So where with the time of year and the timing that this rain would be likely to fall or other forms of precipitation like snow would be in the winter in the, in the fall months uh, instead of in the, the late summer. Next slide, please. And then as another way of looking at this and how this precipitation would impact the local stream flow, we can look at these uh, stream values uh, and these aren't joined necessarily to the whole area-wide thing, but it, what's helpful is just to look at these stream segments 
and say how much percent increase are we going to see which you know when we're thinking about it in conversation with drought and conversation with all of the other hazards like landslide which we'll see next um we can see like in flooding of course uh like in the in the top right the northeast quadrant we can see a 20 percent increase in stream flow and that's quite a significant uh increase uh when we're thinking about flooding and uh overtopping the banks next slide please and then the last thing we'll look at which is a really helpful i think metric when we're thinking about the impact of local localized hazard events and then the sort of more uh let's say global or you know climate system impacts right uh so where we can consider sea level rise as part of um part of the equation that's going into hazards that affect Clark county is is if there is sea level rise or even major precipitation or these other events like off the shore in the pacific ocean for example that can push water up the columbia and into the streams that are connected to the columbia and cause flooding events uh, to those uh, jurisdictions that are adjacent or right next to uh, those water bodies. Next slide, please. All right. And then thinking about flooding, the, the, the impacts are far ranging. They're very connected to other hazards, very connected to wildfire, very connected to landslide, all of these things. So we can think about that in terms of a sectoral approach. Like it, it, you could check every box uh, down the way. Um, Flood waters can contain uh, disease, um, it, they can create emergency management scenarios, they can hinder economic development, they can affect agriculture. Um, it's just really a, across the board that, that this uh, hazard can have an impact on. Next slide, please. All right, <clears throat> and then a connected sort of water-based hazard, seasonal storms. Uh, we're looking at now one inch precipitation days. So this is the change in number of days over a 30 year period versus our previous 30 years that we're expecting to see uh, an increase or decrease uh, in those number of days, which would of course pr uh, produce extreme precipitation events and could cause flooding and all of these different things. So across the area in this next 30 years, we're, we're only seeing a 2% increase in these uh, particular uh, one inch precipitation days. And it doesn't feel like a lot, maybe intuitively, but I assure you that is not the case. <laughs> uh, seeing a 2% increase in, in this, the days of this uh, precipitation magnitude is a, is a significant increase. And I think as we go on in the process, what things will become clear. And, uh, you know, as we all get educated about these like climate impacts, uh, the significance will make a little more sense. Go ahead. All right. And then we're going to look at two different scenarios of precipitation magnitude. The first is heavy, the next is extreme. So for heavy precipitation magnitude events, which is a, a two year storm, uh, which means uh, hard to describe in reference, but it's it's one that we would expect roughly every two years. Um, it's, it's kind of a double probability. And I'm not going to get into the very technical details, but the easiest way to think about it is just to say every year, if a storm happened of this magnitude, then we would only expect it to happen uh, every two years or so. Right. And so we see that uh, at an uptick of 5% across the region and the values are fairly distributed. Um, so we're, we're seeing a little uh, splashiness and like you can see on the map in Hatch, those uh, city uh, outlines are punched out of this uh, value that's being generated. Next slide, please. And then we can look at the extreme precip precipitation magnitude, which is inclusive in a way of that two year number. But now we're looking at a 25 year storm, which has greater implications for flooding, landslides, all these geophysical and or these earth based hazards and these uh, water based hydrological hazards. Next slide, please. So these seasonal storms like are so connected to other hazards that you know it's going to check every single box, every box that flooding checked, like we talked about, uh, which is every box is is going to be affected. And then particularly, right, we have challenges, and in the NHMP, um, this is listed as one of the hazards of greatest impact in, in the region in Clark County. Uh, and so we could go uh, uh, item by item, but down power lines. Um, creating hazards to human health, of course, um, debris that's uh, that's uh, left to be cleaned up and, and creates another um, complicated uh, situation for emergency management uh, and transportation and roads being blocked, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Okay, next slide. 
I'm, t I'm trying to talk fast. <laughs> All right, so here is a little bit of a departure from the data that we've been looking at, which is the climate uh, impact tool that is from the University of Washington in the first slide. Right now we're looking at Dogami data. So Dogami is the Oregon Department of um, geology and mineral industries and that just means they do a bunch of mapping of landslides and earthquakes and and the hazards that would be connected to that sort of process so i'm sure that you've all heard of the big one and so one really valuable aspect of studying these types of hazards is that we produce really really good maps of like where landslides have happened and so washington has produced like through dnr uh, Department of Natural Resources and Ecology, really good maps of historical landslides and ongoing landslides. And Dogami um, in Oregon used that data as part of a regional study to make this really high, um, high resolution map of where landslides uh, uh, are likely to happen. And in this case, I pulled the wet scenario, right? So when we're imagining all these other, um, all these other hazards flowing in, uh, we, we, we have to think that since we're dealing with a wetter climate, that that wetter climate is going to be a forcing or driving landslides uh, and, and other geophysical hazards. Next slide, please. All right, and then landslides, as many of you are aware, I'm sure, like can, and can wreak havoc on transportation networks. Uh, they can pose risk to um, properties that have been built uh, adjacent to or on top of, indeed, uh, slow moving landslides. Um, as Dana mentioned up top with uh, redlining, uh, that's one of the more obvious things that, that is that's well studied across the literature, but we also have a ton of uh, literature to suggest that the siting of um, lower income communities uh, happens nearer to these, uh, these hazards uh, across the board. Uh, next slide, please. All right, uh, wildfire, um, kind of a, a broad swath um, uh, estimation of the danger via the change in number of high fire danger days. Um, so again, we're looking at uh, 30 years, kind of where we are and into the future, and then 30 years in the past, um, and, and comparing those values. So we're expecting to see versus in the past, um, uh, five five more days um, in that in that period, um, and so we see the distribution of that being like fairly mild. Again, off the map, you would see like a higher concentration in heavily forested areas um, where there's more fuel. And yeah, and then we can we can switch to the slide. Uh, hazard up top, wildfire wildfire likelihood um, is our next metric, which is a is a metric of probability, and you can see there's quite suppressed value, very low, low values um, for uh, Clark County. But um, I think anyone living in Clark County and working in Clark County will tell you like the the risk is is real, despite it saying that there's a very small uh, percentage uh, of risk. But this is what the climate projections at this scale predict. So we see Wash, uh, Washington as a whole uh, on the left side, and then the the countywide. Uh, estimations on the on the right next slide please all right and then wildfire um i did forget to mention the last uh slide but uh you know even though just like with sea level rise and um the impacts that the pacific ocean can have with flooding uh we can also see smoke uh, as we did in 2020 um affecting communities, uh, even though it's not the point of origin is not inside the community. And though regionally we have a pattern of wind that is moving from the west to the east, um, we can see how, like if you've been to Hood River or anywhere along there, the Columbia Corridor or the Columbia River can carry uh, smoke back down and, and end up working its way uh, back into the communities, as well as a number of other meteorological phenomena um, like uh, wind can just switch on a dime and then uh, inundate communities in uh, smoke. It's really difficult to escape. It has like very significant uh, health implications for EJ communities um, and is just overall damaging to human health. Uh, next slide. All right, we made it to the questions. Perfect. So I think we have different slides for questions. Well, you're getting a clap from Paris. Yeah, we can celebrate a presentation. Thanks, Paris. Nice work, both of you all. Um, so do you want to bring back, I mean, largely we wanted to kind of start with just any questions you all had for clarity. You got a 
a uh, number of maps, a bunch of information. So why don't we start with just Q&A and then there's some other discussion that we wanna have, but just wanna open it up. It's coming up for folks. Any questions for clarity? Paris? Yeah, I, I just the thought that I'm having is, I, I first of all, Kappa team, soft, holy hell. <laughs> um, I, I was just like screen grabbing every slide. So I have all the maps here, but like, holy crap, it was, I, it was like catching up with you trying to catch them all. But the, um, the comment that I had was it might be helpful to know, I know that y'all came here to present on resiliency. So essentially, these are the hot, here's the hot stuff that happens. How can we make community more resilient if and when this happens? And I think it might be helpful to know what already exists uh, in community for these variety of of issues so that we could take into consideration what has been done and maybe what, what could be done for communities of color in particular or whatever special pop that we're considering. Because, I, you know, I don't even, I have, I don't even know that where to begin uh, where Clark County might have some resiliency efforts already going. Yeah, so Dana Zacher, do you want to start there? Because I also think there's an intersection with some of the conversations you might want to have with community about some of the assets and resiliency that exists. But Dana, do you want to start? Yeah, absolutely. Thanks, Paris. I think that's that's a really good point because right, we're not assuming that nothing has been done or that communities don't have coping strategies already in place. And so, yeah, if we're able to get at that through the outreach that's hopefully going to be happening over the next few months, I mean, part of the question that we want to ask to inform our understanding of what is resilience for different communities and um, what are the impacts is to first say, what are you experiencing? Um, what hazards, what are the impacts that you're experiencing? Why does this matter to you? And what what are you what are you currently doing and what would be helpful uh, to improve outcomes? So anyway, that's just to say yes, I totally agree. I love that point and we'll definitely think about ways um, to kind of frame that as a question that we can get some feedback on. But yeah, as Ben said, we're going to be having some brainstorming about this in a moment so I won't get too far ahead. <laughs> Uh, Levita. Also, and this is just in general, like, you know, there's so many different communities that are being represented here, and we're all doing surveys and we're all doing outreach, but what are the internal structures to make sure that we're not just all asking the same person? <laughs> you know, there are some, just like in communities, there are some people that are more outspoken about stuff and are more willing to like jump on surveys and do focus groups. And then there's other voices that are kind of more introvert. So here we all are doing these like separate different tasks to um, ask different members of the community, but we have no way of asking or making sure that a person that sits in somebody else's focus group isn't just joining our focus group too. So what's the best way to kind of like, I guess, cancel out um, duplicated information? Yeah, Levita, I don't know who that question is directed to, but I would boomerang as they say back. And I mean, I think that's part of what came up earlier, right? Is there a way to ensure that you all have some line of sight in terms of the engagement strategies that you're using? But, you know, and I know that that's not the crux of this particular conversation, although it does have an overlay. I yeah, guess, I mean, I started yeah, thinking about that because it's like if you were to maybe assign part of a county, which well, that would be super hard, but if like if we were able to divide up the county <laughs> based off the number of groups, then we would have like our, our jurisdiction in which we're asking questions, but we're not doing that because there's all this, you know, um, people are, are scattered and the types of communities that we are working with are scattered. So I don't yeah. know. When I look at the maps, there's just no way to make sure that that portion or different portions of the city are being our county are being represented yeah and no, i appreciate that so i mean so i mean i'm going to ask that we come back so i'm going to ask everybody to think about that jenna amy lauren team let's bring that back to some of our work behind the scenes and think about you know, how do we bring this back to you all to have that conversation Right, because I don't think it's kind of like just drawing lines on a map, Levita, to your point and saying, okay, you all talk over there, you talk over here. Some of it 
is unique populations that you all are working with and striving to serve, but there's certainly some overlap. And you know, surveys that get distributed out, maybe you're not concerned if someone receives a survey a couple of times, but certainly asking people the same questions in the same places over and over again could be could be something else. So let's come back to that, Levita, but thanks for for raising it. Any other questions for, for clarity around what you heard? Because we have some other discussion I know we want to have uh, with Dana and Zachary. Yep, I see you, Yolanda. And so just let's make sure we cap sharing. Please put to everyone. So we'll copy Yolanda, you're jumping. Yep, and Paris, you're lifting up with Levita's raising. Okay, well, it doesn't sound like folks have kind of specific questions around what the data that was just presented for clarity. Um, do we want to bring some slides up and just Dana and Zachary? We have a few questions that we could navigate with this group and um, maybe thinking to, with you all what's going to be most valuable. So um, it's kind of like as you think about and absorb what you just saw, and you see the maps and the distribution and the different risks and hazards. Um, so let's do a preview of all the questions and people can kind of jump in. So one is just like, okay. what are the impacts, right? So when you you hear, you know, whether it's wildfire, whether it's drought, whoop, we're going in, we're going back in time. Um, so <laughs> who's impacted in what ways and where, right? Or what impacts are are important to include? as we think about policies. So maybe just starting, I don't know, Dana and Zachary, do you wanna give any additional context? Cause I think part of this is like, let's put some kind of faces and 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 places to what you just, Dana? Yeah, that's exactly right, Ben. So what we just showed is, you know, th these are what the climate projections say for your area. Like this is what we can expect in terms of changes in precipitation and temperature. But what we're hoping that this group can really help us understand is what does that mean? So I know you can't all answer that question for the communities you work in right now, but um, we're hoping to at least get a starting point of understanding of the hazards that we listed, which one of those have impacted your communities before? Um, which populations were impacted by those hazards? What kinds of impacts did they experience? Was it a physical illness? Was it a disruption in um, access to shelter? Um, you yeah. know, there's so many uh, impacts to think through, but just trying to get a starting understanding of like, of all the things we just shared, what are the most relevant and how are those playing out in your communities? Yeah, thanks, Dan. And we're, we, um, and Nicole, you can share. Monica, jump in. Um, we'll, we'll share. We're going to do some live note taking so you can kind of see as we bring it up. Let's go, Monica. And then, Levita, I thought I saw your hand come up. Monica? So, when the uh, the fires hit a couple of years back and the smoke happened and the air quality was just absolutely horrible, I was traveling back from Kelso to Vancouver and I had to uh, drive 20 miles an hour. Um, there's a spot there where you have to like make this like really big, like, like it's like a, an I-5. It's like either you, you, you make the turn, you go with the, the highway or you, you go into the, to the river. Um, and that scared me so bad. Um, I mean, you, the breathing was bad. The, the sight was bad and that's just, and that, for me, it affects everybody. It affects absolutely every human being. Um, and so whether you're inside, outside, like whether you can go outside and, and enjoy some, some air or, or not. Um, and then also, um, uh, whether there's rain or not, then it's like, uh, are we going to get, is the, is the, um, food is our, uh, uh, what we're growing, is that going to give, get enough uh, water or is it going to get too much? Like, it, um, it's just, there's so many different ways of like how it impacts all of us because we're all interconnected. And so um, it's, um, and, and also when it rains really, really hard and you have to get to an appointment or something, that is really dangerous because you're like, oh my gosh, I can't even see, you know, in front of me. So those are my my thoughts for right now. Yeah, thank you, Monica. Paris? Hey y'all, thank you. So um, this is just first blush. But uh, for for the Fourth Lane Corridor community in particular, uh, it, 
climate hazards around extreme heat and I would say extreme cold, so like extreme weather conditions. Um, many of our, our families find themselves like, I think the term is often called energy poverty, but they make decisions about their home energy use based off of their, their financial uh, ability to engage in say air conditioning or or heating and I know that um, coupled with the understanding that we're trying to get folks off of natural gas that will increase the load on on energy we need retrofit programs and things like that for folks' homes but that's a uh, one of the considerations I have another is that I understand that Clark County uh, doesn't have a very uh, sophisticated wastewater treatment process wherein solid wastes that are flushed are are, are burned and there is a large community of color that lives in and around that area of that burn site and there are connections to uh, health comorbidities and that that sort of air that is produced so air quality um, is is a is an interest on the corridor in other places like fruit valley where those wastewater uh, treatments occur um so that those are two things that come to mind for me is is extreme cold extreme heat um just the other a couple of weeks ago we're actually working on trying to form an emergency uh response team for the corridor because there were like 80 individuals that needed somewhere warm to be and had nowhere warm to be um so these are some of the concerns that come to mind uh first and Almendra, if you have other uh understandings that you'd like to chime in please do so and so thank you. Um, uh, so I, uh, June, I see your comment. I think your your mic hasn't been working. Um, I see your comment in the chat. Let's uh, we'll come back to that. Almendra. Uh, yeah, I mean, initially, I think in terms of some, in some way, I think of it backwards. Like, what is making this this uh, population vulnerable, and then how are climate issues exasperating? the already existing problems. So if we have a community that is suffering from the impacts of long COVID or um, smoking or COPD or heart um, or issues of the lung, they're disproportionately um, impacted by those. Then I see like, yeah, uh, how fire or smoke or poor air quality is gonna exasperate that, um, that whole situation. So, um, you know, it's, it's like everybody can be impacted, but I just try to think in terms of like, what's the problem, uh, again, that's being exasperated by these situations. And then for the extreme heat, again, we're, we're looking at uh, for people who have those jobs that make them where they have to work outside, um, taking time off is not an option. There's, there's these economic, these really for real economic impacts um, and how important it is to draw the connection between health outcomes and what's happening in the climate or um, economic outcomes and what's happening at your job for a lot of the people that we are trying to interact with. Because as Paris was saying before, you know, there there's not a lot of, they know that they're being impacted, but it's hard to put that into, um, into words where like it will inspire care because it's not addressing like the current needs or like the the immediate needs at the time or, or helping people to to make those connections between fulfilling the Maslow's hierarchy of needs and how climate issues if not addressed are going to create more, more challenges for that um I think that that's important just to get some buy-in and participating and and um, really finding out what people care about uh, care about and can um, especially, you know, give us insights as to what they think should be prior priorities in terms of planning. Yeah, I love that. Thank you, Levita. Almanja? How, how it's making sense to me because so, so as we're polluting more, as there's more greenhouse gases in the atmosphere, you know, it, our planet warms up, which means like, you know, it disrupts just this whole, um, the whole water cycle. And so water is getting evaporated at a really fast rate. And so that's why I think like we're going to have, we expect to see these droughts um, and heat, uh, intense heat days. Um, and then also makes sense why there will be intense rainy days where like we just get an outpour of, of 
uh, precipitation, which then is also related to our land, our um, landslides, um, because you know th there's not a, like good structure, uh, or I guess just like our you know our our vegetation might not be able to like hold all that water all at once. Um, then it comes down to like um, what people are going to be experiment experience, experiencing. Sorry, um, with with those kind of impacts. And it's just kind of like this whole cycle that's just kind of like gets re reinforced. And it's like, if we don't, again, if we slow down, if we can do two things at the same time where we're, we're um, decreasing our greenhouse gases that is like driving this whole cycle. And at the same time, um, adapting to these impacts. And as you, as you actually, as you adapt, you start to mitigate because, you know, kind of, I don't, I don't know how to explain that, but um, as you, uh, get more informed of just like, okay, like, um, to, I'm kind of, kind of spacing out on this, but anyways, that's just my thoughts right now. It's just like, I think that they'll go hand in hand, um, mitigating and mitigate, adapting and mitigation at the same time. So it's thoughts in my head. Yeah. Thank you, Amandra. wonder, we have another set of questions that maybe we can move towards, um, and I recognize y'all, we're moving through what could be long, much longer conversations relatively quickly. Um, so this goes back to a little bit of a conversation we had earlier in the next you know, five minutes or so, just thinking about you know, how do you bring this information? In Paris, you had, you had kind of named the, uh, some of the strength-based pieces, right? Is it sharing a slide deck? Right, which might not work for everyone, right? But just thinking about like how might you bring this to uh, communities, and what should we be asking folks to better understand? And y'all named some of that stuff. I think it's already in the notes, kind of unpacking. Right, here's some of the questions we should be really thinking about: kind of the who, how, where, and what, but also just really understanding vulnerability, understanding existing strengths and resilience that does exist, but just so I'll just open it up with these two questions and see if there's thoughts that folks have for today. Um, Monica? Um, there's been a study that says that people learn better with play rather than reading or seeing slides. And so um, finding a way to get people up and connected and moving around in a room and finding some sort of way to also have visual aids because uh, people, when people see visual aids, they they remember it better than seeing words, but also words and the visual aids. But play, like we need to get up, we need to get out to our Mother Earth. We need we need to communicate with each other. Um, I mean, try things differently because what has been happening has not been working. So yeah, that's my two cents on that one. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Should I think we can provide a link? Um... Yeah, I see that, Amy. I think it was to interact with the link. The problem, of course, is that we'll have to close it right after the meeting. So y'all aren't contributing and violating open public meeting, but we can we can open it back up. So we could probably throw it in now. If folks want to populate the board for the rest of our meeting, and then we'll have to close the link um, so we're not opening it up um, with risk. So it's going to go. You can see in real time. Anyone with the link can add for the next eight minutes, and then it'll go to only people with the link, or we'll have to close it, whatever the, I can't explain it. Paris? A couple of thoughts for the first one. One would be compensate community for their time, two, meet them where they're at, where they gather already, three, mm -hmm. um, like any group that you're seeking some sort of behavioral change or anything from is, is, is find a way to connect it to something that is salient to them culturally. Um, and then four, diversify what we see as feedback. So like in, in, in the, the methods and, and forms that it comes to us. So some communities come from storytelling backgrounds. So it could be cool to have, like, I'm just having a brainstorm of like, there are lots of, of I've, I've been, I've experienced some different indigenous storytelling um, opportunities. And they talk about these natural disaster events in story form to share messages and in and, and different pieces. So it could be cool to connect that thread with storytelling uh, community backgrounds. And, and let's tell a, our own stories about how climate's impacting our community today, things like that. Um, so multiple uh, methods of 
of interaction and participation, compensated participation and, and meeting folks where they're at and ideally um, engaging with them with, you know, obviously with trusted folks, which is why you've pulled us together. Yeah, thank you, Paris. And then Dina, Zachary, I want to, I know, Gina, I wish your microphone worked because you put some stuff in the chat. There's a kind of the average, there's a couple questions embedded here. It's kind of the average to your storm and kind of some methodology questions around um, modeling. There's also the second kind of piece around how do you, are you accounting for long range development and more impervious surfaces, for example, if I'm interpreting the question, right, that that's, there's actually impacts that are going to go beyond what we see in real time now. I don't know, y'all can read the comment. I shouldn't interpret it better than you all can. Do you have any reflections? Yeah, maybe Zachary can weigh in a little more on the projection tool that was used, but I can answer and say that the projection tool that was provided for uh, by the Department of Commerce for this particular project um, does not, to my understanding, at least take into account future changes in development or future changes in land use. It's strictly based on climate models. So we will start to talk about how changes in land use might factor in. We'll talk about impacts like um, I see at the end of the comment here, Jude, something about uh, impacts on drainage and wastewater. We're gonna get into that as we dive deeper into um, these kind of asset hazard pairs, which is coming up next month as we start to talk about um, risk and vulnerability assessments. We're gonna get more detailed as we go along. So we will start to pull some of that in. But Zachary, are you, uh, maybe able to respond to the first part of this question. I'm not sure if you have this answer either, but um, about the maps being based on modeling scenarios. Yeah. Rather than data. Yeah, it's going to get into the weeds a little bit, so bear with me. But um, so essentially, like, um, we have a couple different like statistical uh, methods, like the way ways that we like to like look at information, and in this case, like. The, the data that we're using is the result of taking a lot of different models and different scenarios and then and bringing them all together and then taking the median value uh, instead of the mean value. And so the mean would be the average as in add every value and divide by the number of values that you put in. And then the median average would be the average directly in the middle between the, the lowest and the the highest uh, value in that scenario. So what you're looking at when you look at one of those rectangles, the raster cells, uh, as they're called, um, is just a median value. In, in most cases, we had a couple different types of data, but for the majority of the data, we're looking at the median value of many climate models, right? It's called an ensemble model when you, when you do it that way. And the reason that they do that and take that approach is to kind of reduce the unknowns and the the what we would call the margin of error or MOE, like in the in the in the projections, right? Um, so as far as being inclusive of like development changes and scenarios, like when we look at something like RCP 8.5, um, which is like business as usual, it's not only including like in when you build a model, you have to make assumptions, and those assumptions are, uh, let's say to a degree like more or less like volatile or more or less influential on the outputs of the uh, model and so like in this case the business as usual 8.5 assumption is sort of assuming that we're doing everything that we've been doing uh so far and so if we look at a city from above and we look at the for for the example you provided the amount of impervious surface in 1980 versus the amount of uh, pavement and all of those things today, um, we would see a noticeable increase in the patterns of development. And that climate model is implicitly or making the assumption that those sorts of patterns uh, are continuing on into the future. So if if you make any changes in those land use, like uh, uh, decisions and, and, and plans, then you start to put uh, put yourself off at a, at a different trajectory, which in this case would be like RCP 4.5. So the less emissions or the less CO2 in the atmosphere. Um, it's a really, it's a, it's a pretty dense concept and I'm happy to like answer 
specific questions, but I also don't want to muddy the waters and make it hard for people uh, to wrap their heads around. So just, uh, I want to spend as much time as we need to spend on it. Yeah, thank you, Zachary. Other questions, comments, thoughts on these? Uh, yeah, something that comes to mind um, is just when I used to teach writing, people would start off with as a, an attention grab or like a, a quote or a percentage or some some data point that's supposed to be like enticing. And um, and the feedback we always gave is like, so you give this quote or you give this piece of data. The question that your audience could be asking is, so what? So what? We're getting less rain or so what? We're having more wildfires. And so just in trying to keep the community or all of our communities engaged, I think we need to be very intentional about answering that question of so what and what's in it for me to give you my time at this time. And I feel like uh, Paris touched upon it when we're offering comp compensation, but always having the, the ideas that just because we're excited about like climate and the possibility of climate work, other people are not, and we're going to have to really answer, have some solid answers for like what's in it for them and why this is important, why this is relevant. And as long as we can do that, and we may need to collaborate on just how that messaging happens so that we can promote some of the activities that we're doing. But as long as we, we can do that, I feel like I feel a little bit less, um, I don't know, not, not cynical, but skeptical. I feel less skeptical about uh, what we're going to get in terms of feedback from what we're planning on doing. Yeah, that's that's like an existential question for you all uh, in your role as an EJC is to help frame the so what. And I think that's in some ways that was partly what y'all are asking tonight is like, okay, we show you this. How do you bring that to community in a way? What is that that um, that grab that you're describing, Levita? That's the what's in for me. So what? Why should I care? How's it impact? Paris, jump back in. I just want to piggyback real quick and uplift what Levita just said. I think that it will be very, very important, both for us, but for you all as well, to work with us to identify what some reasonable expectations, next steps, outlook that community can expect will be an outcome of this process. I think very frequently cities, counties, other you know bodies of power uh, look to CBOs like those on this call that have rapport and trust with communities of color or special populations communities and and they and communities begins to sense that you're not we, we're knocking on the door on behalf of x y and z and there there becomes a growing issue where it just feels that you've you know you come to us to do the trauma dance and we do the trauma dance and then you take the data and you you run away and write your comprehensive plan and never follow up with us about what the hell happened. So I do think it will be important for the EJC community as well as the project team and everyone on this screen to have some some diligent conversation around what that process looks like so that we can be good stewards of the rapport and trust that we have with our community. Yeah, that's well said, Paris. And, and Monica, I see your comment in the chat. It probably isn't a today conversation, um, but I think it's an important one. Right around accountability, um, and it's probably a deeper one than we have in the last few minutes. But Monica, jump in. Yeah, and also um, bouncing off of uh, Paris's uh, comment, like um, I, I wanted to possibly get a billboard to like for like our uh, our proposal, but I realized it was way too expensive to do that. But if like the a county could get a billboard and say, you know, we want to hear from you. And they just don't stop. Like they have that billboard there. So they see it because it's like, we want your input. We want you to join us. We want you to be here. We don't want just to be, this is one time thing. Like, like also creating that trust within the things that we're doing our all our events, all our surveys, but then also like having people see it because it like, we don't want to just be like this ghost that comes in like, Oh, look at us now. And then we're gone. Like we want to be a present presence that remains with people. And so billboards are a great thing. So I just wanted to plant that seed. Thank you. All right, thanks, Monica. And I think for, you know, as you all, I mean, well, y'all can debate the role of billboards in our landscape. Um, 
But certainly, I mean, from a messaging standpoint, right, just thinking about kind of what methods and tactics does the EJC use to reach the populations, again, that are overburdened and that are vulnerable. And so, you know, as you all are developing those, I think there's some um, filters that we can use. So thank you, Monica. So before, before we use any more of our time, I did want to do a check. I know we kind of skipped over public comment. I know most of the folks, um, I, I guess I want to offer, if there's anyone in the audience um, that'd like to offer public comment, Donna, you have your hand up. Can I, is that for public comment? Let's promote Don. So I'll give the spiel. You got up to three minutes. Uh, name, please respect the time limit. Um, I know you have some other spaces to contribute, but Don, do we have you in there? See, you're not in the attendees, so hopefully you're transporting into the room. There you are. Don, please jump in. Uh, thank you. And this is regarding equity. Keep in mind that the Climate Commitment Act is designed to, to be equitable. And it's, but what it's doing is raising billions of dollars to pay for clean energy projects. And people are complaining all over the social media, media about their high gas bills. And if you're getting a high gas bill and you're not getting compensated for it, like, like the law is designed to say this, if you are classified by law as lower middle income, then you your energy burdens must be reduced as a result of this law. So if you have high gas bills and you're qualified as low income, then there should be a mechanism for your bills to be, your energy burden to be reduced. Either you get bill compensation or you get something like a heat pump water heater. And that's all I have to say. Thank you. No, thank you, Don. Um, appreciate you being here. And Don, before you get transported back, you want to say who you are? I know folks met you in the CAG joint meeting, but for the record. I'm Don Steinke, Climate Action of Southwest Washington. I'm on the CAG group. Great. Thank you. Um, so for the other two folks in our audience, uh, just raise your hand if you'd like to offer a public comment. Thanks for your patience, if so. Not seeing any. Um, so group, I, I think we'll we'll try to wrap up. We have four minutes left. Who would have thought that in a three hour meeting, we ran short on every topic um, it felt like, but um, really appreciate it. I think there's some real learnings here and there's a couple of things I'll, I'll just reflect back for some next steps. So one, our team will do some work behind the scenes to, um, I think we should probably try to survey y'all if you're willing to take one just to give any feedback um, and reflection around how we can make sure that everyone can contribute better and we can design our agendas. So we're learning as we go along to meet y'all's needs um, while trying to do our work as best we can. Um, we'll share all the materials out. And so some of that might be just as you prep for our next meeting, uh, which is April 1st, uh, it'll be right on the kind of cusp of, of the engagement timeline that um, Clark County folks showed you earlier. Um, but making sure you all have some time to, to spend. We'll have to revisit the equity lens. Um, Dana and team, we should, and Zachary, we should circle back to make sure if there's any other information that would be helpful for you all that you're getting it. We took some notes today. And then, you know, I, I will ask folks if there's, um, you know, we, we were going to do a lot of live note taking today using a Jamboard. One of the things we'll ask of you, if, if you all have comfort using that technology, we can incorporate it more um, just as a way to bring more of the voices in the room and make sure that we're getting as much input as possible. Um, Jenna and Amy in particular, anything that you want to add as we're doing closing? Um, I think that the uh, first of all, again, I, um, I know three hour meetings are long um, and there's so much to cover and it did feel a little rushed. Uh, so thank you all for your patience with us um, as we, um, yeah, work, work on that moving forward. Um, Amy, anything you want to add? No, just thank you for being here and your input so far. Yeah. yeah. Well, you have some training, so make sure you do your open public meeting act training, um, submit, get paid, right? Submit your invoices. 
um, and then continue to work on your engagement plans. And you did hear from each other tonight, so you know it's going to be more organic than structured. But if there's if you heard folks uh, around the table, um, feel free to reach out to them. But again, not seeing the tall group. Lavita, I think to your comment, I mean, I think we may need to try to find a a way to talk about just doing some level of quality assurance, maybe if that's the word, um, to try to think about, you know, maximizing the reach um, while not overburdening or going back to the same people um, over and over again. So that's that's uh, y'all's collective job to think through, but let's see if we can create some structure around that. Yeah, I mean, Monica, you know, Let's let's revisit it at a different time, right? Time, budget, energy, competing interests. There's a lot of things that that could prevent that. But um, you know, y'all, I don't ask folks to do unpaid labor. So y'all are contracted to do, you know, to to attend the meetings and you're getting compensated for that. Um, you know, we can revisit like how do we make these meetings as most most um, effective and efficient. Um, but also, um, certainly, if there's work that you all want to do outside, I'm not going to stop you. But I'm not going to let's let's come back to that. I see your comment. I'm always happy if folks want to come together more often, but uh, there's often constraints on that. So let's first start with maximizing our time together, being efficient, finding multiple ways to engage. Um, and with that, it's 6:30 on the dot. I appreciate you all. Thanks for the grace today. Um, this is our first meeting trying to get through a lot of stuff. We will make some course corrections um, and just make sure this feels like a really uh, meaningful space for folks. So I appreciate you all and thanks for uh, your all your time today. Okay. Thank you. Bye. <laughs> Thank you. See ya. Bye. Have a good night.